I said. Don't hit the drums. <laughs> oh, I'm tempted. I'm tempted to pick, pick up one of these. How about this? Grab yeah, this I have a phone back here. <laughs> All right. Testing, testing. One, two, three. One, two. All right, Jim. Let's hear you one more time. Testing, testing. One, two, three. How's it go? Sounds good. Hey, hey. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, hey. Actually, I don't you mind that. Good level. Good level. <laughs> Just holding on to it. Yeah. All right. Jim, you want to do that? Or you you know, want... I might, might do that, too. Sounds like you've been, uh, you've been doing this before, Jim. We can all be rock stars holding on like the times. And welcome to Street PX, a photography podcast, coming to you recorded live, live recorded, whatever, however you want to put it, from the Harvey Milk Recording Studio at the Harvey Milk Recreation Facility here in sunny San Francisco, right off Du Bois Park. And uh, I'm looking around here and I'm seeing a lot of equipment that is a bit overkill for our podcast, but I mean, it's been 50 episodes. This is where we should be, right? Hey, we deserve it. Yes, uh, but I'm seeing guitars, I'm seeing mixer boards with more buttons that I know what to do with, but, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it's awesome because it's, it, it's, it's soundproofed. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which we certainly don't have at the old uh, Street PX studios. No, not at all. <laughs> uh, this is October 20th, and you are hearing Casper, and joined at the mic by my good friend and co-host. Hey. Hey, Jim Watkins, man. Hey. It is a special episode today. We are celebrating our 50th and two-year anniversary. Can you believe it? No, I can't. <laughs> it's, it's been, it, I, I, it's very surprising to look back on where we started and, and now where we are. Yeah, I'm telling you. I mean, when, when, we, when we started, the, the first show was us riffing about each other. Yeah, because we didn't have a guest or anything. We were just like, hey, let's just sit down at a table and just talk about street photography. Yeah, in a closet. <laughs> in a closet, yes. Yeah, that's, that's where we start. The humble beginnings, you Yeah, know? <laughs> and then uh, later we eventually upgraded to the living room. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, I mean... The amount of, of talent that, that we've we've had the honor of having come in and, and talk to us about their backgrounds and their the inspirations that brought them to the camera. Uh, I, I mean, I feel I feel like every single time we have a new artist in here, I'm, I'm that much more humbled by uh, a kindness and openness that everybody has. That's right, man. And you know what? We learn from pretty much each and every one of those people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our, our, you know, our own horizons and our own perspectives have been widened by talking to all these people. Yeah. It's, it's been fantastic. I will say this. It's, it's, it's not without a little bit of selfishness because, I mean, we do this, this show and, uh, and, and we are so appreciative of all of our audience and all of our guests. But, you know, we do this, too, so we can learn and we can get inspired just like everybody else. We get just as much out of it. Um, maybe at times even a little bit more because we get to keep talking to our, <laughs> our <laughs> guests right. before and after yeah. the mic turns on. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's amazing how much you learn just by sitting down with somebody getting to know them, learning about their lives. And, you know, it's great to go to a gallery and check out work or open up a photo book or something. But whenever you actually get to really ask questions and hear uh, from the artist what their interpretations of what their their street photography uh, means to them or um, their documentary work and to actually have them describe what they went through to do it. I mean, you, you look back on some of these episodes, there's been some pretty... I mean, harrowing tales. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. From, I mean, fascinating, fascinating stuff. Yeah, from like war-torn Haiti and, um, uh, or uh, was it Guatemala? You know, I mean. Yeah, we, I think yeah, Guatemala, yeah. I, I yeah. mean, we, we could just kind of like close our eyes and point at an episode and, and there's going to be a, a mass of content that you're going to get something out of. I know. I mean, we've we've had guys who have dodged bullets to get to you know to get the story. You know, yeah. I mean, really, yeah. Hey, and you know what? I want to give a shout out to our very first guest, Ray Cayetano, man. Yes, yeah. He he, start, he kicked it off. Big he love to Ray out there, definitely. Yeah, and he he yeah. was the first one with the bravery to come into to that closet. 
<laughs> that's right. He didn't know what we were going to do to him. <laughs> right. He came into our closet, sat down. I think at that time we had a microphone that was like strung up and hanging from the ceiling. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then with the power of Patreon and all of our contributors and, and Glass Key Photo, our sponsor, we've been able to upgrade our equipment and just bring uh, a, a better quality, a, a higher production value of all of our shows to you, our audience out there. And we definitely uh, look forward to increasing that as we continue. You. Yes, fantastic. Yeah. Man. Thank you, everybody out there. Yes, big, big thank you. And and if you if you haven't jumped on Patreon or anything like that and you want to give back, definitely go take a look over at patreon.com forward slash streetpx and that'll give you some more information about it. Um, really quick, all of you wonderful people that joined our, our film week contest, that's the social media contest as well as the, the film photo share, uh, we want to give a huge heartfelt thank you to everybody. We had a great turnout. And, uh, and just to, to let you know, we're going to be announcing all of those winners here coming up next week in just a little micro episode because it, the deadline was last night and, uh, we're still trying to decide we had some, such great imagery, man. <laughs> I'm telling you, this. I mean, this. This is going to be difficult to do. It really is. Really is. This is some really good quality work there, man. And we're going to be giving out a bunch of prizes. I think I, I already. I. I believe there's going to be like four or five uh, winners we're going to be choosing because we just want to give a bunch of stuff away. Um, yeah. <laughs> additionally, additionally, uh, we have opened up our uh, secret print exchange that we do. It's our second annual because it's our second year. And um, so definitely go and take a look at Street PX. It's going to be a place where you can sign up and join us. Uh, deadline on that is going to be October 30th. So go and sign up. It's free to do. And we're sending prints all around the world from all of our different listeners. And, and you can be one of those and get a really cool print for just the price of postage. Yeah, that, that was really nice last year, man. I mean, it was a brain, your brainstorm. Kudos to you for doing that, man. This is fantastic. So I'm looking forward to this one this year. Hey, it's always nice to try and spread a little creativity around and no better oh, way yeah. of doing it than with prints. Oh, yeah. Jim, you recently went to uh, a, a really awesome exhibit over in San Francisco with a big group of uh, San Francisco photographers. You want to describe that a little bit? Yeah, we went to the uh, San Francisco Museum of, of Modern Art, and we saw the uh, Walker Evans exhibit. And it was about, um, you know, one, one of the chief aspects of that was that his approach to the American vernacular, and it was fascinating. They had images from all across his career, you know, as a photographer. And, you know, pretty large group, about 14, 15 of us went out, were out there. We were discussing the images. I mean, it was you know, it's fascinating. So if, if, you're, if you're in San Francisco... Uh, check it out, and that one's running until I think January or something like that, or I even think maybe so, yeah, yeah. It's it's running I for a while. So, around, yeah, it's gonna be running for a while here in that uh, SF MoMA. Yes. So yeah, so if you get a chance, check it out. Yes. Check it out. And myself, uh, I, I kind of missed out on that group outing because I, I ran up to Sonoma, um, as as most people I'm sure are aware. California has been experiencing extreme wildfires. <laughs> yeah, California is pretty much on fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, from top to bottom, and yeah. uh, you know, and as photographers, we want to be able to go and document that and share the stories of those uh, affected by these fires. So that's what I ended up going up and doing the day that you guys uh, were there at, at the moment. Uh -huh. I actually went back. Uh, up to Redwood Valley a couple of days ago with okay. a friend of ours, CJ uh, Lucero. But uh, he was kind enough to invite me uh, along, and we drove a couple of hours north, just above Clear Lake, and got a chance to, to go and speak with some of the victims uh, that lost everything. Um, even got some pretty interesting access to some of those that live up to, uh, kind of in the Mountain Crest area, kind of off the grid. Uh, CJ was able to circle back and and rekindle an old friendship with a friend uh, with a friend of his from high school like 20 years ago and <laughs> called him <laughs> up and we all got together and had a really you know interesting day um, a lot of uh, a lot of photos taken a lot of great stories and truly an example of how strong the American spirit is it, it, mm. going up there and seeing this in person I don't care how many photos you have or videos or audio what have you um, that's only that's only going to be able to give you kind of part of it. But experiencing uh, this physically and emotionally is just, it, it, it's, it weakens the knees. That's all. That's the only yeah. way I can put it. 
That's right. And I understand you guys got some recordings of some of the uh, people that you, uh, that you talked to up there. We did. We did. Um, more or less for just kind of like record purposes. So that way we don't yeah. mess anything up, you know, right. but um, but we did record audio. Um, if any of it comes out, obviously, you know, we may end up putting that together into a project. And that's just something that me and CJ has been talking about, mainly to be able to maybe match up with a foundation or something to see what we can do to help continue assistance from outside areas because you, you, we all know that when it comes to these kinds of things everybody has a very short-term memory oh well, yeah the, the news cycle just turns over especially with the current administration oh. something else is going to happen and it, you know people will forget but uh yeah this you know you guys going up there and documenting that is uh i mean it, it's gonna it's really important yeah because in the, like you said the news the news cycle turns over so fast so quickly yeah yeah I, yeah we, we we cannot forget this cannot no and i was actually i went to a place called fisher lake drive um cj and i in redwood valley and uh, denise was one of the victims there on that little community mm-hmm. and it was completely decimated at the time uh, she was telling us uh, she was one of her stories she was talking about was uh, a lady by the name of Katrina and her family, which was one of their next door neighbors. This was about one thirty in the morning and the fire had already breached over the crest of the mountain coming down onto them within like 10, 15 minutes. That's how quickly it moved. And wow. they had no warning, no sirens, no alarms, nothing uh, except for Katrina and her family that ran around knocking on doors, honking their horns, just whatever they could do to try and, you know, bring the attention to everybody that was asleep in their bed while their homes were being engulfed. Man. And uh, unfortunately, a couple of people did lose their lives there uh, in that location. If you are looking to to help, we'll be putting a donation link uh, in the show notes. So go take a look there. And, um, and and that might then, you know, that's an option that we can do that goes well beyond the old thoughts and prayers thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. You know, some action. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, but, real action. Uh, but let's kind of move past that. Let's go into some plugs. Um, I know you got one, a really good one. Yes, yes. At the, up at the UC, Ber- at UC Berkeley, um, there's a an exhibit at Gordon Parks. Mm. Uh, it's, at the, uh, it's at the Art Museum, the UC Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. But it's a, it's a really this is the first time I've ever been to it. I, I did check it out a little bit. It's a beautiful museum, uh, right there at the at the Berkeley campus, and uh, the exhibit is worth it. I mean, it, it's all it's, its focus is narrow. It's about one piece that Gordon Parks did for Life magazine back in 1948, and it kind of and it kind of talks about how his vision of what it, the what the piece should have been and what the what the photo editor's vision of it. And they were totally different. Mm-hmm. And they also, they, you know, they had contact sheets that showed how the how the photo editors viewed the work and how they how they ch- kind of change how things. they kind of edit, yeah, to to the, to what the way they saw it. And it was is a fascinating look. Yeah, it's fascinating look at what they do. So uh, I I highly recommend that Gordon <laughs> Parks at the um, at the UC Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Nice little uh, nice little opportunity to to peek through the keyhole to see how how things worked uh, with Gordon yeah, Parks. Yeah, yeah, the the reality of the situation. Right, right. Yeah, he he wasn't very happy with it. <laughs> when uh, when does that one run until? That goes until December 17th. Excellent. Glad you asked. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I've only got a couple myself. Uh, one I'll be really brief with because it relates to uh, our very special guest today, Jay Blakesburg, who is a local Bay Area photographer, but um, so much more than that. He's a rock and roll photographer for, I think he, it, we're knocking on 40 years, I believe his career uh, is, is right at the peak of. And on uh, November 9th, uh, there is going to be an opening reception at the Harvey Milk Photo Center. And from there, he is going to be showing a ton of magnificent metal prints. And uh, and I, I don't even know how many pieces of work he'll be dem- uh, having on display there. But you got to go take a look at this. And if you have an opportunity, there is a lecture he'll be giving on November 11. And uh, with that, you do have to register because space is limited. And I only I think there's only a few seats left. So we'll put that, that in the show notes, the link to how to go and register. It's free. But... But you do have to sign up. This is going to be interesting. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yes, uh, before we move into the show, I do have to take a moment and give some love to our sponsors, Glass Key Photo. These are the guys uh, over in San Francisco. They've been around 
for years and years. It is the preeminent uh, film photography store. They're downtown. They're located at 1230 Sutter Street, open every single day of the week from 12 to 6. And, and there's only two of them. It's Gordon and Matt. And they're still open seven days a week. <laughs> I don't know how <laughs> these guys it? do it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a great little it's a great little store that they have over there now yeah. yes yes and they're always doing something um i know they're talking about pulling together their their grand opening and that's going to be happening on november 16th definitely go and take a look from 12 to 6 there's going to be a ton of people there it's a big event giving a big celebration um uh, for the opening of their new uh, store their new building right there off sutter uh, van ness and sutter is the best kind of way to to put it so if you're in the neighborhood go and say hello to Gordon and Matt and maybe buy some film. All right, man. I'm, I'm there. I'm already there, man. <laughs> yes, yes. All Mark right. those calendars. Yes. Um, and uh, that's enough for this. We I want to get into this episode and talk to our man, Jay. Here. All right, I mean, man. I, I'm <laughs> so proud to have him. Uh, and he was fortunate enough to come out to us here at the old Harvey Milk Recording Studio. And uh, let's just go ahead and jump right let's into it. Take it, it away. Then. All right, on today's show, we have a friend and fellow photographer of the Bay Area, Jay Blakesburg. Thanks so much for having me on Street PX. Super excited to be here. Hey, we're glad to have you, man. And uh, it's going to be a great episode. We're going to kind of go down the roads of what makes Blakesburg tick. Sounds like fun. I'm ready. <laughs> so just kind of start out, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So I'm a San Francisco-based photographer now. Uh, I'm 55 years old, and I've been shooting since I'm 16 years old. So I'm getting pretty close to 40 years here. And I grew up in suburban New Jersey and picked up a camera when I was 16 years old, built a dark room in the basement of my mother's house. And uh, life has never been the same. Better living <laughs> through chemistry, as they say. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so you had the dark room, huh? Yeah, I wish I had me one of those. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I've logged in thousands and thousands of hours in, in traditional dark rooms, uh, going back to, like I said, to when I was a teenager. And so, uh, you know, I took pictures of my friends and whatnot, but I think uh, when I really sort of found my groove was when I started bringing my camera to concerts. And uh, specifically, I brought a camera that my dad loaned me, an old Pentex. I don't know the model number. Um, he loaned me his Pentex camera with a couple of long lenses and I brought it to a Grateful Dead concert in September of 1978. And, uh, let's see, I was still 16 years old at the time and, uh, it was probably my, that could have been my second Grateful Dead concert, um, if I'm re remembering correctly. Um, yeah, I think that was my second Grateful Dead concert. And, uh, so I photographed that and, and really what I loved about it was that I shot, I developed my film I printed eight by tens and I thumbtacked them to my bedroom wall. Really? <laughs> right. And yeah. that's what it was about. It was about creating some sort of memorabilia to like capture that moment. And uh, I guess that was early social media when my friends came over to my house to hang out and drink beer and smoke marijuana. Um, you know, they got, to, they got to, they got to see the photos on the wall and that was, that was social media back then. Also, that's where the thumbs up light came. Yeah, it is. <laughs> exactly. you know, that, that, yeah. Yeah. You know, but there was only four people there. So we only got four likes. Oh, know? okay. But, uh, uh, I was but, doing good back then. But, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and then I just kept bringing my camera to more concerts and more concerts. And uh, my senior year in high school, which would be 1979, they built a dark room in my high school. And uh, the, the, the auto shop teacher was the photography teacher because he was the guy who was the only guy who knew how to develop a roll of film. Right. So he, by de facto, he came in and I was the very, very first person in that dark room to make a, a print. Right. We just, you know, there weren't, wasn't really a, it was just a classroom. We put some paper over the glass window on the door. There were no other windows in the room <laughs> and uh, set up some enlargers on some desks and brought some water in. I think there might might have been a bathroom <laughs> attached to it and <laughs> set up some trays on some desks. And I made the very first print. And, you know, here I am 40 years later, still. You know, still checking along, still, still <laughs> taking pictures and making prints, maybe not in a traditional dark room. And, and so, you know, by, by the time I graduated from high school, I was bringing my camera to more concerts and, and, uh, um, we're going to get to this later. One of the reasons we're doing this podcast is that I have a big career retrospective show coming up here at the Harvey Milk Photo Center in November uh, with the opening on November 9th. And we'll talk about that later, but, uh, there are photos in that show that I took when I was in New Jersey because I want this to be a career retrospective and I want people to see sort of the arc of my work. And so the very, very first photo that I took that actually ever was published in a magazine 
was a picture of a guy named Yorma Kalkinen. And Yorma uh, was the guitar player in the Jefferson Airplane and later on, went on to form a band called Hot Tuna. And Yorma still plays today. And um, uh, we went and saw him in May of 78. So this is about uh, a month before the end of my junior year in high school. And at the end of the concert, uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't even have a driver's license yet, right? You had to be 17 to get a driver's license in New Jersey back uh-huh. then. Uh, we were, we'd got a ride up to the theater. It was the Capitol Theater in Passaic, New Jersey, from my buddy Lazzie, who was two years older than us. He was friends with my brother's group of friends. And he had a Carmen Ghia. Do you know what a Carmen Ghia is? It's a little two-seater Volkswagen that oh, has, yes. <sighs> has like a tiny little bench seat. And me and my buddy Nikki sat in the little back bench seat because we were little pipsqueaks, you know, about four <laughs> feet tall. And we went up to see uh, Yorma, and at the end of the concert, we went to the side door and waited for him to come out. And we photo, you know, I have a couple photographs of him coming out the side backstage door. And then he jumped in a limo, and we had our car right there, and we followed his limousine into New York City. Straight paparazzo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we didn't know why. We just wanted to meet him. Like, yeah, of course. You know, we were 16 years old, yeah. right? And so we, he stopped in Midtown at a deli. He got out to get some food, and I went in, and I had a camera with me. And... Um, and uh, I said, hey, Yorma, how about a smile? And he turned around and I took this photograph of him with these big blasted out eyes and this giant smile with he has a big giant gold tooth right in the front. <laughs> right. And and I got the photograph and I took that photo and I processed the film and I uh, made a print and um, I mailed it to a magazine called Relics Magazine, which still exists to this day. It's a music magazine that focuses on the Grateful Dead and jam bands and a lot of the stuff that I cover to this to the, this day. And I wrote a little letter to the editor. Hey, my name is Jay Blakesburg. We went and saw Yorma. We followed his limo. We stopped at a deli. I got this photo. How about a smile? And they published it, right? And so it was a letter to the editor. I didn't get paid any money. And it was a uh, you know probably two inches or so big. And, and a friend of mine from high school recently showed me that page. He had it when I did a speaking engagement in New Jersey nice. a couple years ago. <laughs> and uh, and that was my first published photograph. Now you have to remember, you know, back then there was no social media, there was no phones, and so for a 16 a, a year old kid to be published in a magazine that you read and subscribed to was like pretty epic. Oh my right? god, yes. Yeah, there's and no Instagram so, for them to steal from. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, in September of 79, so I was uh, technically a freshman in college. Uh, it was actually right before school started. Uh, the Grateful Dead did a show up in Rochester, New York, which is about a eight hour drive from where I lived in New Jersey. And I think six of us piled into a giant, you know, old Chevy car, three in the front seat, three in the back seat. Uh. We drove eight hours straight to Rochester. And I had met a guy at, at a dead show earlier that year. And he said, Hey, I'm going to review this concert for the Aquarian weekly. The Aquarian weekly is like the SF weekly or the Bay guardian when that right. still existed here, you know, free newspaper. I think the Aquarian weekly actually is owned by the same people now that own the SF weekly. I think it's all the village voice media or, or whatever it's called these days. Gotcha. And, um, and so I sent them two photographs from that concert in Rochester, uh, one of Jerry Garcia, one of Bob Weir, Phil Lesh, and Bill Kreutzman, the drummer in The Grateful Dead. And they published both of them, and they paid me $15, $7.50 per photo. <laughs> and uh, I was still 17 years old at that point, and that was the first time that I was paid money for my photographs to appear in print. Mm-hmm. You became a pro. And yeah. there I capital was. P. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, a capital, capital PX. And, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, so that was sort of the beginning of my photographic career, Uh, and that just, those little things are just sort of enough to inspire you to kind of keep doing it. And, Mm -hmm. and, and I don't really know if at that point my goal was to get better Mm -hmm. or to understand it, you know, cause when you're 15, 16, 17 years old, I mean, I have kids that are 21, 23, you know, you don't have a lot of intense interests. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've read books. I'm, I'm reading a book right now by the great photographer, Dan Winter right now, Dan Winter or Winters. I think it's Winters. Uh, and he talks about when he was young and he was making super eight films and, and uh, then got into photography and miniature model building and all this stuff. Like I didn't have that kind of focus and intensity about photography. I just liked the fact that I was taking pictures and my friends liked them yeah. and that maybe that made me cooler or maybe they liked me more or maybe that you know made me fit in in a different way in a in a you know when you're in high school it's tough being social it's tough Mm -hmm. being in that situation just in general Mm -hmm. um you know where do you fit in where's your place in the script and so uh but the other thing that i started doing back then is i started photographing pictures of my friends that i was on tour with following the grateful dead fans deadheads and uh, and to me now, 40 years later, 38 years, 39 years later, 
to me, I wish that I did more of that mm -hmm. uh, because that is the essence of, I mean, that was my version of street photography. That was my version of visual anthropology, right? Mm -hmm. Anthropology being the, you know, defined as the study of humankind. So this was this tribe, right? One, Bob Weir once from the Grateful Dead once said many, many years ago, uh, on a television show, it might have been like the Tom Snyder show or something like that. One of the late, late shows, right. pre Letterman and cars, you know, around the Carson time, stuff like that. And uh, he was the CBS guy, I believe. And Bob Weir said, you know, we're a bunch of misfits playing for a bunch of misfits. Right. And so, you know, there were bumper stickers, misfit power and miss, you know, T-shirts. And we, that's what we were. We were misfits. You know, we were we were square pegs trying to fit into a round hole, which we couldn't, which was regular society because we were, you know, we had discovered this thing. We had discovered this adventure. Mm -hmm. um, Jerry Garcia once said, you know, uh, following the Grateful Dead is truly the great American adventure. Right. And we tapped into that in the late 70s and the early 80s. And we were doing that. And I was doing it with a camera. Yeah. And so I have all these incredible photographs um, that, and I brought a couple of books with me that I'm going to leave with you guys. Oh, um, great. That's called Hippie Chick, A Tale of Love, Devotion, and Surrender. And, and my Hippie Chick yes. book is photographs of women that are in this scene and whose lives have been changed by the live music experience. Right. And so, and, and there are photographs in this book that I took in 1980. I think that's the furthest back that they go. Mm -hmm. And again, so if, you know, to do a little Bay Area, San Francisco pop culture history lesson, you know, the birth of the, the Haight-Ashbury, the true Haight-Ashbury hippie psychedelic movement started in San Francisco in 1965, even though 67 right now, the, the summer that just passed, everybody right. calls it the summer of love. Um, if you talk to the people that were in the hate in the mid sixties, they will tell you that the summer of love started in 65 mm. by 67. It was a media circus, time magazine, life magazine. That's uh, when the mainstream caught wind. Right. Of it. 60 minutes did a big special with Harry Reasoner called the hippie temptation. And it, you know, it became a media circus, but the pure essence of the, of the hate Ashbury and the, the psychedelic zeitgeist of the hippie movement started in the hate Ashbury in 1960 and spread from there. It spread to London, it spread to New York, et cetera, et cetera. But that's ground zero. So, um, uh, you know, two years ago when Hippie Chick came out, my book came out and I started talking and doing lectures about it and stuff like that. I would say that, you know, we're 50 years into that movement where, you know, that tribe, right? right? So think about people that are visual anthropologists that are studying tribes in the Amazon that maybe started studying them in the sixties or seventies. And they found these tribes that only existed for 30 or 40 years back then. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, those tribes are a hundred years old or 80 or 90 or whatever. But back then when they first started discovering these people, there was these tribes and these places that splintered off and visual anthropology, you know, 50 years was a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, you have correlation with this tribe Right. Now, you and know. so now here we are 52 years later, and I've been documenting this tribe now for 40 years. Right. This modern day psychedelic um, hippie circus with a keen eye to focus on the people, not just the artists, not just the artists. Right. right. And so and I did focus on the artists as well. But well, of course, but I do have this body of work of these people. And when when my book Hippie Chick came out, um, I got a lot of comments from people that were like, you know, I look at these photographs and. Some of them you look at, and I think it probably might be more when you're looking at a picture that was shot on film or a black and white photo versus, say, a digital photo, which obviously has a different look and feel. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, across the board, people say, like, I can't tell if this photo was taken in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, oh, the right. 90s, or the 2000s. And part of that is the way people dressed, right. and the length of people's hair. And, you know, the only way... Uh, you know, once many, many years ago, somebody told me, you know, like a great way to sort of set a time frame in a photograph is by, you know, showing the price of gas at a, a gas station mm -hmm. or the type of cars that are driving around. So if you look at photographs that were taken in the Haight-Ashbury in 1965 and 66 by, let's say, the great um, photographer Jim Marshall, mm -hmm. you know, all these cars are from the 50s. Right. Most of them are like late 50s cars. Right. So now, you know, in the 70s, if you were shooting pictures and there were cars from the 60s, it helps set time and, you know, set and setting. Right. It's, right. it's it helps set that that time frame for you. And just um, sense of place. Right. And uh, so, you know, taking that away from some of these photographs and you're just looking at what they're wearing mm -hmm. and because people still dress that way, uh, you really don't know when these photographs are taken. They're timeless. Right. You know, There's so here, word, so here you have exactly. this still photograph. Right. And this is the beauty of photography, as you guys both know, because you're both photographers. You have this still photograph that is just stillness. 
but there's so much story in that stillness. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and a lot of times, um, for me, I've always liked to share my stories using multiple images. So I've done 13 coffee table books. And if you look at my books, uh, a lot of them have multiple, multiple photos on pages because I feel like it's telling that story. Right. But when you have a single photograph, like what was happening to the left and the right, what's the context of that photograph? Right. And so, uh, without that context, all you have is that still photograph and your imagination to dive into it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and experience that moment that that photographer chose to capture at a 250th of a second or 60th of a second or whatever it might be. Right. And, and discover the story. Exactly. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, like there's always that kind of debate on, are you telling a story? Uh, You know, what are you doing with the image? I, I firmly believe in the, you're an enabler of a story. You're establishing the, the foundation for the viewer to interpret whatever they may interpret from it. And and following that, I mean, looking at an image, you get that suspense of not just what's outside the frame, but that suspense of what happened before and after. Sure. Right. And, that, and that's all the context that's actually missing mm-hmm. when it's just a single still photograph mm-hmm. from a scene. You know, of course, you can use the um, Henry Cartier-Bresson image of the kid jumping over the puddle. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, what was happening? You know, nobody knows. Like, did was that set up? Did he just, was he just so on it with focus and exposure, right? You know, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Right? how so, many shots? Yeah. Right? <laughs> but maybe he was, right? The mm-hmm. decisive moment, right? We've talked about yeah. that in history classes and everything else in photography. And so um, so a lot of that is, you know, a lot of photography is preparation and being um, yes. ready to capture that unique moment in a split second. Um, and that's sort of, you know, the basis and, and, uh, uh, trajectory of what I do is, um, uh, what I like to call anticipating the play. Um, and that's a baseball term or, well, that's a term that came from my little league baseball coach when I was 10 or 11 years old. Right. And so I don't know if you guys are baseball fans or whatever. Um, but, um, but so here, so let's, let's use this analogy here, right? Um, you're in, you're, you're in the field, you're playing defense, you're at second base, Mm -hmm. Jim, Uh and there's a man on first ground ball gets hits to you. What is your play? My play is to go to second base. Exactly. Casper, you're in left field. Okay. There's a man on first base line drive hit to you. That hits the ground. You don't catch it. It's a, a, a ground ball. Let's call it to you in left field. What's your play? And thrown to the cutoff. Or to third base. Or to third base, yeah. Right, okay. So the same exact, the, 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 you know, there's a man on first, but you're in a different position. And so if it's hit to you, you have a different play that you have to make, right? right? And so if you anticipate the play and think about that in advance, right? Because you don't want to have to think about it in the, in the moment right. when that ball, you already know. If a ground ball comes to me, I go to second. If it's a line drive to me at second base, I throw it back to first to try and get him out there. Right. You know your moves before it happens. So when I'm in front of a stage shooting a rock band and I know the song that's happening or I might know something that's coming up, like there's a peak moment coming up or there's a vocal coming up or a a guitar solo that's coming up. I'm anticipating that play Mm -hmm. and I'm getting ready for it and I'm capturing it. And I'm doing the same thing when I'm photographing fans. Right. People have said to me, oh, my God, your pictures of people dancing at concerts are just so, you know, the timing is so right on and so great and it's you know because i'm anticipating that spin that move you know to me if you have a picture of somebody dancing and their arms are down and their head is just tilted a little bit it's way different than if their arms are up and spread out and above their head and their eyes are closed and their head is back right and so again you're anticipating for that moment to happen and you're waiting for that moment to happen and then when you do you've got your focus you've got your exposure you've got everything set up you've got your background you're where you want to be boom you got it right mm-hmm. you're yeah. not decisive so you're you know you're preparing yourself for that decisive moment it shows how important it is to know not just your camera but what you're shooting if you know being a musical photographer yes oh good no i'm sorry go but i was gonna say that's that's the one thing one of the things that i really wanted to to talk to you about and you've, you've answered it waiting for the peak moment when you were mentioning that on your website right i, saw I, that. I was i've been i've talked to a lot of people and they always say you know there's a lot of photos out there of so-and-so band on stage but they just don't capture the excitement of what your photographs caption. And so social media is, is a, a huge perpetrator of this bad behavior, which is, you know, people taking cell phone photos or even photos with professional cameras 
of famous people and posting them. And then you see all these comments. Oh my God, incredible because it's a famous musician mm -hmm. that's standing on stage. Well, you know, that person could be throwing up on stage and people be like, Oh my God, amazing photo because it's that famous person who I'm in love with because they're my favorite artist. Right. right. Familiarity. But right. no, what that is, it's mediocrity. Right. So, oh, yeah. so, so, so unfortunately, you know, and I love social media, I'm, uh, you know, I have a huge Instagram following and I love posting on Instagram. You know, we all love the, you know, adrenaline dopamine rush that you get when people like your photos on Facebook. Facebook and I got over a hundred, you, you, you know, and, and, and we all love that. And I love sharing my body of work for me, you know, photography has always been about sharing my work, not taking pictures and leaving them in a shoebox so nobody sees them. Right. Right. And so, um, uh, so it, with social media, you know, we, li we live in this world of mediocrity and we become immune to being able to tell the difference between a brilliant photo and a me me mediocre photo. And, and for me as a photographer, you know, that it's great that I photographed Jerry Garcia when he was alive. And it's great that I photographed the Rolling Stones and, and, and whoever else, you know, Carlos Santana, Neil Young, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when I'm out there trying to get work today, I'm not showing pictures that I took 25 years ago mm -hmm. or 30 years ago. I'm showing pictures that I took last week or last month or last year, mm -hmm. right? Because I need to remain relevant. And mm -hmm. I always say that when I get an assignment to go do a job, it is my job to come back with brilliant photos. Now, can we all be brilliant every time we go do that? No, but we try to be. Right. Right. And so, and we recognize when we don't achieve brilliance and try and figure out how to do it better next time to get closer to that brilliance. Because the bottom line is if you're a photo editor, Jim, and you're hiring me to go do a job and I don't come back with something really good, the chances of you hiring me are slim. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a photo editor at a magazine or a design firm or a corporation that that only hires and only ex is only interested in mediocre photography because it's cheaper. Okay. Yeah. Then you don't care if you hire me once or twice or three times because there's another guy right behind me that'll yeah. do that job for a quarter of the mm -hmm. price of the really good photographer. Right. There's a line out the door to the street. For right. That. And so and so that's the problem is that on a commercial level, there are a lot of people that are. Um, art buyers, photo buyers, hot, you know, people that are hiring photographers that aren't qualified to be hiring photographers, right? Mm -hmm. They're not photo editors. They're not trained as photo editors. They're not trained as art directors. Um, they're production people or marketing people that never took a photo class or never took anything, you know, don't understand that. And so, um, and so they can't tell the difference, like a really great photo editor, you know, people like, a, you know, Jody Peckman at Rolling Stone and Griffin Lotz and Sasha Lecca at Rolling Stone. You know, they live, breathe and eat photography every day. And they can tell the difference between a mediocre photo and a brilliant photo in a, in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. But you get these people that aren't qualified, but it's their job in a communications department or whatever. Oh, we need a photographer to do this, an event, a headshot, a portrait, an ad, you know, a, an annual report, whatever it might be. And if they don't know that they're hiring somebody, they can't tell the difference they're basing it on price, really, right? And yeah. it's a bad place to be in as a commercial photographer. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked about this before and how important it is to have photo editors. That's like during the big purging, you know, a few years back, like when Sun-Times got rid of their entire staff, like John White and, you know, these Pulitzer Prize winners, like that that enough was was disastrous. But what people don't didn't talk about was, yeah, you got rid of these award-winning photographers, but you also got rid of the award-winning photo editors, the one, the unsung heroes, the ones that whose eyes judge and make the decisions on what hits that front cover. Right. You can have all the great photographers in the world at your staff, but if you don't have somebody with any half sense to choose the imagery, then it all goes to shit. Right. And and the other repercussions, and this is this is maybe getting a little deep here. Bring right? it. Oh, get deep. But, get deep. But the other repercussions of everything that we just talked about, right, is is you know living in this world of mediocrity, which is a big, big chunk of what we see out there in social media mm -hmm. and everywhere, magazines, whatever it might be, you know, newspapers, is that when I was growing up and when I was trying to become a commercial photographer and, and I was trying to shoot for Rolling Stone, which I've been shooting for for 30 years mm -hmm. now, um, I was inspired by all this brilliant photography that I was looking at in magazines, you know, people like Mark Seliger and, and Frank Ockenfels yeah. and Albert Watson and, and Herb Ritz and that Richard Avedon and Irving Penn and the list goes on and on and on. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I was seeing all this work 
regularly. It was showing up, whether it was books I was buying, magazines, you know, whatever it might be. And I had that to inspire me. I used to, when I was first started doing portraits for magazines, I had a big giant manila folder with tear sheets of photographs that I liked. Ooh, I like the way that he posed these, this band with five people. I like the way this guy posed these people with three people. I like the way this single portrait is. I like the lighting in this, right? And when I'd get an assignment to go shoot something, I wasn't necessarily trying to copy any of that, but I was using it to inspire me, yeah. yes. right? And there was so much of it. And I'd flip through it and I'd see what was relevant to the job that I had or the location I was shooting in. And I would use that to inspire me to go out and make hopefully a brilliant photograph or, you know, something that was memorable or, you know, really, really good. Right. And so, um, what happens today is that when we live in this world of mediocrity because of budget or, you know, it, because the bar is so low now to get into photography, anybody mm-hmm. can go buy an $800 digital camera and say, I'm a professional photographer today. Or pull out their cell phone and try to say right. the same thing. Exactly. <laughs> uh, is that we lack inspiration. And so there isn't new, great, brilliant work being done on the, in the, with the quantity and quality that it was being done, let's say even 20 years ago. Right. And it's not just photography, but we'll use photography as an example. And so, um, if, if your government is support is not supporting the arts, right. If, if, if corporate America is not supporting brilliant art and younger people aren't inspired, then we all suffer. Right. Because, because when you walk into a museum, as a photographer, if you're going and looking at other art that's not photography, you get inspired for it, right? So if, if if Trump decides to cut all funding for all artists and there's no more performance art or sculpture art or whatever it might be because these people can't live and do their art anymore, um, we, all, we all lose because we all do not benefit by having that inspiration to go out and make great art. And, and having inspiration and passion across the board, whether you're an artist or not, even if you're not trying to be an artist, but going to see other people's art inspires you in your everyday life, mm-hmm. whether you're a businessman, a businesswoman, a student or whatever, it, it raises the level of your awareness of creativity and makes us all better people. Right. Yes. I know this is all kind of no, 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 because I see, no, no, no. It's good because I see it as it's in another way that we're losing our culture. Yes. With that, if you it's easy for like a fiscally focused person to say, oh, money, money, money. And then let's cut all the arts. And it, that's not really benefiting anybody, you know, service wise, what have you. It is really because it's 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 our culture, it's our our way of life, it's our world, our artistic creativity. Mm-hmm. What were you gonna say, Jim? No, I was I was just gonna say because I I can really identify with that because back in when I was in Chicago, I was a banker, you know, and it was there was a lot of time money yeah, man, yeah, <laughs> money, that's right. But you know, you you're you're under a lot of stress and strain. But what I would do, I would go to the um, Art Institute of Chicago, and I would look at the art, and I would be inspired by it. And I would, you know, it, and I would go back. My mind is, my mind is different. I'm in a different place, and I can go and I can do what I do. What I do on the banking thing, I'm, I'm benefiting from that art, not necessarily, you know, not directly as an it's artist. It's to your life, but and yeah, exactly, exactly. And it, and it really, and that really helps. It is so that it is so important. I think we just want people in general on the planet to be inspired and passionate. Yeah, period. Because exactly. those things make us better people and yes. makes us a better society. And so when those things get taken away, I just think it's a problem. It's yeah. ter- terrible, so, terrible. And it's it, well, it's a domino effect too because it things like that is kind of like a a, a core issue <clears throat> that leads to other issues: the loss of creativity, the loss of productivity, the loss of a lot of this stuff is based on just a a sense of well-being and comfort and and uh, appreciation. Mm-hmm. Just going to pop in real quick to throw some love to our sponsor, Glass Key Photo. This is San Francisco's premier analog photography store and a staple for many photographers here in the Bay Area. If you're looking for analog gear, repairs, film, old or new, amazing zines by local artists, or simply want some great company and the opportunity for some fun photo walks, this is the place to be. You can find out more information and upcoming happenings by following them on Facebook or Twitter by searching Glass Key Photo or visit their website at glasskeyphoto.com. Now, after five years in the colorful and historic hate district, they have relocated closer to downtown. 
You can now find them at 1230 Sutter Street. That's between Polk Street and Van Ness. It's a fantastic new venue offering a ton of space, breath of fresh air, I'm sure, for not only Gordon and Matt down there, but all photographers here in the Bay Area. Above all, while in San Francisco, be sure to visit Glass Key Photo and give a big hello from all of us here at Street PX. Um, one of the things you had made a mention a while ago, you were talking about Hippie Chick. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, that one's not just about the photos either. You have some essays in there. Yeah, so the book is called Hippie Chick, A Tale of Love, Devotion, and Surrender. And you can get signed copies on my website. Here's the shameless plug, <laughs> www.rockoutbooks.com. And uh, check out uh, all my books there. And um, so Hippie Chick has three essays in it. called One's called Love, one's called Devotion, one's called Surrender. And there's a gr- another essay up front, and then Grace Slick uh, from the Jefferson Airplane wrote The Forward, the original hippie chick, and a mm-hmm. woman named Grace Potter, who's sort of a modern-day hippie chick, a musician out of Vermont who yeah. lives in L.A. now, uh, wrote The Afterward. And uh, so, so love, love is about how you love a band or a song or an artist and how you um, uh, love what they do and how you connect to that, or you love the community that goes to see that band, or, you know, you love the, f- the people that are around it. You love that community. You dive in because you're just, you, you love everything about that experience, right? With that artist, those songs, whatever it might be. Devotion is being devoted to that band. So that might be traveling long distances to see them at concerts or festivals. Uh, uh, It could be waiting online all day on a sidewalk so you can be right on the rail in front of your favorite artist. It could be collecting all their memorabilia, song lists, collecting their live music. Um, You know, you're devoted, you know, to to that. And then surrender is going to that concert and surrendering to the moment, right? Surrendering to the Mm. flow. And, and being there and being present there and not thinking about your mortgage, your rent, your car payment, your carpool, your children who are safe at home with your parents or your in-laws or the babysitter. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, yeah. And everything is okay. And so just to be in that moment, you know, love, devotion, surrender, right? And, and that's how people and these women respond to that music, especially music in the jam band world, you know, with the Grateful Dead being sort of the, the, the original tree and all these other bands being roots and branches off of that, you know, fish and string cheese and widespread panic and mo and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, there's a strong connection between any music fan, but I focus specifically on women and, uh, uh, and their aspect and their connection to that music. And uh, the woman who wrote those essays is a woman named Edith, Edith Johnson. And she's an incredible writer, an incredible person. Uh, we met at a festival. Uh, actually, we met post festival because she saw a photo that I took of her and asked if she could repost it on her Instagram. She had a blog called The Festival Girl. We became friends. We met for lunch in Brooklyn. And she ended up writing these essays. And she's just this mind blowing, brilliant, brilliant <laughs> person. <laughs> Um, could not have asked for a better partner on this project. And I had a woman design the book and, you know, everybody that worked nice. on the book except for me was, was, a, was, yeah. a, was, was female. Uh-huh. Um, and so that's, you know, that's just one of, you know, 13 books that I've done of my work. I have 13 coffee table books of my photography. Which are coming out of rock out books. Yeah. Most of them come out of rock out books. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a new book that's coming out, uh, end of October. And, um, this book is called Eyes of the World, Grateful Dead Photography, 1965-1995. And this book has 61 photographers in it. Uh, Some me, big me, names in here, Yeah, too. me being just one of the photographers. Uh, and I do have 50 photos in this book, so I actually do have the most photos in this book. But we have Jim Marshall. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have Herbie Green, who was a legendary Haight-Ashbury photographer. Uh, Baron Woolman, who was the first Rolling Stone magazine uh, staff photographer. We have a couple of Annie Leibovitz photos in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, David Garr, who was a big New York shooter, kind of contemporary of Jim Marshall shot a similar thing, but on, on the East coast. And, um, the book is 12 by 12, 272 pages, and almost all the photos in it are either a full page or a spread. There's a handful of smaller photos in there that just sort of help with the flow a little bit, but yeah. we wanted to keep everything big and bold and beautiful. 
And uh, it really is. We just got the advanced copies in just a couple days ago. Looking and good. it's beautiful. It's just, <laughs> right. you know. And yeah. I, Nothing uh, like that feeling of yeah. seeing the book for the first time, is it? Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and, and Graham Nash wrote the forward for it. And oh, uh, nice. we have some book release parties happening. We have one in uh, New York City on October 28th at the Morrison Hotel Gallery. And we have one on November 30th, which is a Thursday up at Terrapin Crossroads in San Rafael. That's Phil Lesh's nightclub. Um, so those two, those are two big book release parties that we have, and we'll be in some other places here and there. And, you know, if you, if you follow me on Facebook at Jay Blakesburg photography, you'll see stuff posted about where and when, you know, we'll be with that book, but super excited for that, that, that project. Well, I'm going to definitely check those out. Yeah. Yeah. We'll throw these dates into the show yeah. notes and yeah. kind of keep that posted and right. keep everybody updated there too. Now I want to flip the script a little bit. I want to talk about this fare thee well your your experiences with this fair, the fair the well concerts. I mean, it's it just I looked at the the um, you know where we're talking about contemporary contemporaneous brilliant photography. Man, I tell you, it was just fantastic. Oh, <laughs> I love. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have one? No, no I, you know it's funny because I, I'm a gift one. <laughs> I almost brought a fair the well for each of you guys too. I'm like, ah, oh, that's too many books. But no, I'll, I'll, I would have. I'll, I'll bring to... I'll bring it to the opening for you. Okay, so, great, uh, fantastic. Uh, here, but for sure, yeah. No, I'll get, get you guys those. So. Fairly Well was, for me, a monumental experience yes. on many, many levels. And so, so first of all, um, I was the chief photographer for Fairly Well. And for those of you who don't, don't know what Fairly Well was, it was the 50th anniversary celebration of the Grateful Dead. Mm-hmm. And they played five concerts. They played two in Santa Clara down at the 49ers Stadium. And then they played three shows in Chicago at Soldier Field, which is a big stadium there that the bears play at. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the reason why they chose soldier field is because that was where the last concert happened f- with Jerry Garcia. Uh, he died about a month after they played in soldier field in July of 1995. And so, uh, so I was asked by the promoter, a guy named Pete Shapiro, who who is based in New York City, and uh, Pete actually owns Relics Magazine these days, the magazine that published mm-hmm. my first photo, and he has some other venues. He has uh, the Brooklyn Bowl, he has one in Vegas and one in New York, and he also owns a, a, a theater called the Capitol Theater in Port Chester, New York, that he does sh- regular shows at with members of the Grateful Dead, and, and he's a big deadhead, and and whatnot. And so he was able to get the band back together to do these shows. He called me up and said, Hey, I need you to hold some dates. And he gave me the three dates in Chicago because they hadn't booked Santa Clara yet. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Whoa. And he's like, you know, this is what's happening and you can't tell anybody. So of course I had to keep this big secret about, you know, what it was and who was going to be in the band as the guitar player, which was Trey Anastasio from the band fish, uh, for about six weeks until they announced it. And, um, so, they announced the shows, and of course, there's just a lot of anxiety because there is different, very different personalities between the, you know, the the four uh, surviving members of the Grateful Dead. Uh, they're known as the Core Four: uh, Phil Lesh, Bob Weir, Mickey Hart, Bill Kreutzmann, um, two drummers, bass, guitar. And um, so, as it got closer, uh, I went up to one of the rehearsals up in Marin, and we did some band portraits of them and some individual portraits. Uh, Justin Kreutzman, who uh, directed the DV, the live DVD, that Bill Kreutzman's son had an idea that at the end, the, the very last song, the very last night, they would do a, like a slideshow and show still photographs of all the band members that have ever been in the Grateful Dead, because there's a variety of people that have died that have been in the band, and people that have left that have been in the band, and so on mm-hmm. and so forth. And so I provided, uh, I think, just one of the older vintage photos, and then I provided all the new portraits of all of them today and uh, so fairly well was chugging along and I took some some you know in Santa Clara one the first really truly iconic photo was a shot that I did behind Mickey Hart the drummer his manager said go up on the drum riser and I went up and I got a great shot and you could see the whole stadium I shot it with a 14 millimeter you know yeah, lens with yeah. you know the 1424 Nikon 2.8 and uh, uh, so it's behind the drums and I posted it on on Facebook and it got a lot of attention I mean I you know we're talking about hundreds of thousands of views and uh my social media feed blew up during that whole week <laughs> because, like, oh, what the hell happened? because you know i i have, I have about 60 62 3 4, 000 facebook followers and probably fifty thousand of them are deadheads right so yeah. so my my social media feed was on fire uh uh that week and um anyway so 
uh, I posted that photo on it, and then there was a there was a company on site that was making these big giant vinyl banners, and it was everything from you know where the dressing rooms were and where catering was to big giant vinyl banners of band members over the years that they had displayed. They had licensed a whole bunch of photos from different Grateful Dead photographers, and they had them displayed throughout all the stadiums, uh, backstage, and in the and in, in, in the general public areas. And uh, so they took that photo of mine of Mickey and they made a big giant sticker decal of it, like, you know, three, four feet across. And we hung it up. We uh, we attached it to a door backstage in Chicago and uh, a guy named Corin Capshaw, who manages Trey and Fish and Dave Matthews, he said, this is a brilliant photo. But you know what you need to do? You need to get a shot like this where the whole band is out on stage, turned around facing you with the audience behind you. And I said, you know, that'll never happen. I said, <laughs> only. I said, I said, can you help me make that happen? He goes, oh no, 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 that's on you, Jay. You gotta figure <laughs> it out. So I came up with this. I came up with this grand plan that I was gonna make up a little story, which I did. And I said, and I and I and I went to each band me- member's manager first, and I said, I have this idea. On the last night, before they come out and play on stage, what if they came out and greet the audience? It's not a bow, goodbye, and thank you, because they're going to do that at the end of the last song that night anyway. They're going to do a big farewell bow. I said, come out and greet the audience. Thank them. Pump your fist. You know, Phil Lesh likes to bow down like I'm not worthy. Like, you know, Uh I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. And I said, come out and greet everybody and then turn around and greet the 10,000 people that are behind us because it's a stadium all the way around sitting in those seats. And I'll be standing up on the drum riser and I'll get the shot. And one by one, all the managers signed off on it. And then they all said, we'll explain it to the band members. So one by one, I explained it to all the band members. And then uh, Phil Lesh, uh, I kept trying to, you know, get, I kept asking his manager, did you tell Phil? And she's like, no, she's like, no, just go explain it to him yourself. Cause they're going on in 15 minutes, you know? And I was like, or maybe it was a half an hour. And I went up to Phil and I said, Hey, blah, blah, blah. We're going to do this thing. He's like, yeah, Jill, Jill told me what to explain this to me. And I said, you know, you'll come out and he's like, okay. He's like, sure, let's do it. So he was the first one that came out and he, and he, and he called the band out and they all knew about it and they all walked out front and they, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm on this step ladder, right? Four feet, three feet up in the uh-huh. air above Bill Kreutzmann's drum kit. And, uh, and there's 70,000 people screaming with their arms in the air, holding their cell phones up, of course, taking pictures. <laughs> and uh, and I'm on this ladder, like almost like, you know, the Memorex commercial where the guy's in the seat with the being blown out of the <laughs> yeah, seat. Right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. that's what it felt like to me. Like I'm like I'm like trying not to get blown over by all this en- energy that's like yeah. coming at me from 70,000 people that are freaking out. OK, that the band is out there greeting them before they play. It was like just the most epic moment of my life. It's right? the arrival moment. Moment too, right. so it's the first time they see him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just at this show, this was the last show of the five nights. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and and of course, um, uh, you know, the anxiety anxiety levels for me are just so high because, like, what if my camera fails? Oh God! Like, what if? <laughs> What if something happens? What if a card fit? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, yeah. a thousand things could happen. What if, you know, somebody turns on a really bright light from the side and one half of the picture is blown out? You know, like there could yeah. be anything that could really could have happened. And I tried to orchestrate it. I actually did talk to the lighting people and ask them for a big white wash and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Oh, good call. And, and, um, and they came out and they did it. And it was the most epic, epic moment. Yes. Like ever. It was, and, and, and so, um, but the thing about that photo is, is that, you know, if you have to remember if, from the beginning of this podcast, I talked about going to see the Grateful Dead when I was, you know, 16, 15. I saw my first show when I was 15 years old in 1977. Um, so I went from being this little kid deadhead with a camera that I borrowed from my dad, you know, going to shows, having fun, dancing around, traveling with the circus, following the band around the country to being the guy that the that was hired to capture the iconic Photograph that's representing the band for their fiftieth anniversary. Can you Arena can Shannon. you imagine? Just I mean that that that's just a great story. Yeah, yeah. That is yeah. A, but the story isn't over, right? And no. so and so um, so then at the end of that show, I was up on stage getting ready to get the last bow. Same way I was going to put a ladder up on the drum riser. Billy would jump off to go down, and I would get that the final bow. But they were playing a song called "Addicts of My Life," and I'm up on stage, and I had forgotten about the video that Justin Kreutzman was going to be doing. And all of a sudden, everybody starts cheering, and I can't see why everybody screaming at the top of their lungs and I finally walk to the back of the stage and I can see a big giant jumbotron up high that's behind the stage right Uh that and I can see they're flashing photos of the band up there you know Jerry Garcia and Keith Godchow and Pigpen all the previous members that had left the band or died or whatever and then they start getting to my photos from that I shot 
the portraits of it rehearsal right before this, you know, a week before, two weeks before. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one by one, I and mean, people are cheering, and then they get to, you know, Bob Weir, and the crowd goes wild, and they get to Phil Lesh, and the crowd goes even wild. And I'm like, holy shit, man, these are my pictures. You know, I know they're cheering at the band, but this, they're, these are my photos. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, pictures are right? instigating this. And then they get to the last photo, which is a picture of the band that's playing on stage right then and there, the band portrait that I did. And the place erupts. And I'm just like, oh, my God. Like, what a moment. Wow. Like, I know that this is like, <laughs> wow. you know, I, there's 70,000 people freaking out at the top of their lungs. And they're playing a quiet song. Addicts of My Life is like a mellow, acoustic kind of song. You uh-huh. know? I mean, their whole band is playing. There's drums. It's electric. But it's very, it's not a rocker. Mm-hmm. It's a very personal, deep song. And, um, and, uh, but, but the, the crowd is just is going completely. Ballistic. I mean, and <laughs> oh, I'm just like, man. and I'm like almost in tears, right? So anyway, um, you know, the show ends, I deliver all my photos to everybody that needs them and we get them all out the door. And the next day, um, the next day I, I, I jump on a plane from Chicago and I'm by myself. Um, I think my wife was flying to New York and my kids were flying wherever they were going, New York, I think also. And, uh, I land in San Francisco and I get in my car driving to the city and I put on Sirius XM Grateful Dead channel and they're playing not fade away, which is the last song before the encore, the last night in Chicago. Mm. And I, and I'm like listening to it. And, um, and then Phil Lesh comes out and Phil's a, a organ donor survivor, right? He had a liver transplant that saved his life many years ago. And he always talks about how this young brave boy who died very young saved his life. And, uh, and I'm listening to this and I'm in the car and I've got the hard drives with me with the 18,000 raw photos and I just started crying hysterically yeah. like by myself. It was just like this intense moment. Like it just was like it all just, you know, cause it had been building up for six or seven months since December the year before, yeah. you know, to this final moment where I was home, it was done. We got the picture. It was epic. Our minds were blown. The fans minds were blown. It was just unbelievable. And so that's my 50th anniversary of the Grateful Dead story. And, you know, someone who had been around that band at that point for, you know, 35, 36 years. So wow. And it culminates fantastic. in our hometown, Chicago, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. We're both Chicago boys. Yeah. Not, not me. I'm oh, I am me. Right. me. Oh, both of you guys. Yeah, right. wait, you, yeah. wait, you have a funny accent. We're, you're from Chicago? Yeah, it is a funny accent. He no, no, no. I was in Chicago for a number of years, but I grew up Southern Illinois. That's where this uh, Appalachian accent okay. comes from. Got it. <laughs> I was born and raised got in Chicago. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Right, right. Right, right down the street from Soldier Field. There you actually. go. So, yeah. yeah. So, just a, you know, truly remarkable moment in my life in every way, shape, or form. And And we did a book. So we did a book uh, from those shows, and it's a coffee table book. It's called Fare Thee Well, you know, celebrating the Grateful Dead's 50th anniversary. Bill Walton, the great basketball player, yeah. Deadhead, wrote the phone oh, yeah. for it. Oh yeah, <laughs> and uh, and it's it and and I have to say thank you for noticing the photography because I think the photography in the book and it's it's the book is about. 75% me and 25% my team, other photographers like I had, cause I couldn't do the big wide shots cause I was, you know, focusing on the macro, what was going on mm-hmm. on stage. Yeah. So yeah. I had in, in Santa Clara, I had a, a local San Francisco shooter named John Margaret who's a great shooter. He was my, my backup guy. And we had sort of a couple little peripheral people that were sort of on the team peripheral if I needed their stuff. And in Chicago, I had a guy named Chad Smith who's based in Chicago. who's a great shooter. And uh, Jason Kazrowski, I brought on at the last minute cause they had a big fireworks display one night and I wanted to have like a third person just to make sure we got the fireworks mm-hmm. on the top of the stadium. And so all the big wide stuff. And then it's funny, there was, a um, uh, another guy and, uh, Anyway, so there's there's a few other photos in there. There was a giant rainbow that happened during during the show in June okay. and Santa Clara. Yeah. And and Pete Shapiro, the promoter, uh, he he made a joke that he brought you know brought in a rainbow machine and somebody in the press quoted him <laughs> that and it showed up like in Billboard magazine. You know, concert promoter brings in rainbow machine, forms rainbow at Grateful Dead. You know, fifty. You know, it's like. It's like, you know, just one of, one of those bringing know, science. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very, very funny thing. So did you find along the way, like uh, as you were shooting, like for the Grateful Dead, for instance, um, that your work changed, like the way that you approached it changed uh, with that familiarity? Sure. So back in the film days, as you get to know the music better, of course, you can predict things and you can be, you know, as we talked about earlier in this podcast, uh, you know, anticipate the play. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so yes, I got better as I knew the music more. I got better as my skills as a photographer in, improved, as my technical skills improved, as my uh, understanding of light improved. Um, so yeah, uh, but I think of course the big shift came with the shift to digital. Yeah. Um, and and first of all, I was a very early adapter to digital, but not shooting with digital cameras. So I built a digital studio going back into about 90, 98, I guess, 98, 99. And that was buying scanners. So we bought the first round of Nikon's 35 millimeter cool scan. And we bought a big flatbed scanner that was, I think, made by Agfa that at the time was probably mm. five or six thousand um, dollars. And so we were still shooting film, but we were delivering our uh, jobs digitally to our clients. We were, we were doing the scanning because at that point I just didn't like the look and the feel of digital cameras. I was a Nikon guy. Canon was a little bit ahead of the curve, but there really wasn't a full frame Nikon camera for a while. And, and even the early full frame cameras, which were, I don't even know what they were, D whatever's, you know, weren't that great. And, they were $10,000. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're not even talking about the yeah. price. And, and, yeah. I, and I just wasn't going to go down that road and buy a camera that was obsolete in 18 months. No. You know, for 10 grand. My, you know, at that time, you know, my business wasn't, you know, in the 90s, my business as a commercial photographer was huge. At 2000, you know, 9 11, 2001, it all changed for everybody. Mm -hmm. And it took, you know, it took a good, you know, eight years to build that business back up and re establish myself and reinvent myself with a digital camera or in a digital domain. And so, you know, still shooting film and deli delivering you know, digital files. I still shot with my Hasselblad and, and, and I, and I love film. I, I, I haven't shot film in almost nine years now, I think. Um, but you know, for me, the beauty of shooting film was, is that I could shoot with a Hasselblad. I could shoot with a four by five camera, which I did. Mm -hmm. I could shoot with a half frame camera. You guys know what a half frame is? No, I don't. Right. It, I think, what was it? The M4P or something uh, like that? It was a Like Fuji, I had the half frame. Or, wait, wait, wait. No, Pen Pentex? God, I can't. Pentex had the yeah. half frames, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Pen F. It was a Pen F. That's it. And so uh, a half frame gave you, it shot a half a 35 millimeter frame per shot vertically. Oh, so okay. two of those vertical frames was one traditional 35 millimeter horizontal uh -huh. frame. And the reason they invented this camera um, was um, uh, as a tourist camera. So when you went on vacation, you could shoot 72 frames per roll of film. That's why. <laughs> but we used to I used to do it to like do in camera collages. I would do like a close up of a half of somebody's face and then pull back into a full face and, you know, or, or flip it vertically. Uh, or horizontally, right? Because uh -huh. it's the opposite of because when you're holding it horizontally, you're, when you're holding it horizontally, you're getting a vertical shot. And when yeah. you flip it and maybe do like you know shoot just your legs from your knees down, then shoot your knees to your chest, and then shoot your chest to your above your head, and come up with these like weird little triptychs, <laughs> you know. And I used it very arty, and I shot with a wide lux. You guys know what a wide lux is, right? Yeah, yeah. it reminds me of like ransom letters or like some a serial killer, would right? Have. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so I had all these different. Film, uh, uh, cameras, right? All these mediums, two and a quarter, four by five, 35, wide lux. Um, and then on top of that, I had all these different lenses, fisheye and long lenses and fast lenses and, you know, everything in between, right? And then on top of that, you had all this film, you had all these film choices. So you could shoot fast grain black and white film, you could shoot fine grain black and white film. You could shoot fast grain Agfa 1000 transparency film. You ever shoot that film? It was like super, super grainy, like golf balls, right? Seen, yeah. But it was like, you know, it was like, a, it was a look, it was like a painterly look, yeah. right? You could shoot color negative film and process it as slide film. You could shoot color slide film and process it as negative film. Mm -hmm. There were all these different flavors. And then of course there were all different speeds. And then, you know, like uh, when you come to my show, here at Harvey Milk on November 9th, um, there'll be a lot of images that are very blue, right? And, you know, me and my daughter always joke that was my blue period, right? You know, stealing the Picasso blue <laughs> yeah, period, yeah. right? And, uh, and so I used to go out and do a lot of portraits where I would shoot with tungsten film, right? So mm -hmm. if you guys are film guys, you'll follow this, which was, you know, a 3200 degree Kelvin type yep. film. So if you shot that film outdoors in the shade, what's going to happen? It's going to go even more blue, yep. right? And so I used to shoot a lot of tungsten film in cold in cold settings um, uh, to give it that blue look. And so I have all these you know portraits of that'll be in the show. I have one of Joni Mitchell, one of Tom Waits, one of uh, Carlos Santana. Um, I can't remember what else I have that's in from the blue period, but there's a bunch. Flamey Lips. 
Um, and that's how I got that look, right? So mm -hmm. this is, we're not talking Photoshop here. We're not talking sliders with color balance or, you know, white balance or anything like that. We're talking, you know, thinking in ahead of the game, you know, so when I used to do a portrait of somebody, I might shoot them in two and a quarter and I might shoot them with a 50 millimeter lens and then do the same portrait with a 120 lens, right? That's close up on their face. And then I might go and shoot some 35 with a fish eye. And then I might shoot it with an 85 available light wide open at F2. And then I might get out the wide lux. And while the lens is spinning on the wide lux, I might be moving my whole camera <laughs> to get long streaks, right? You've seen that look, mm -hmm. uh -huh, you know, yeah. and then I might break out the half frame. So I might do a portrait of somebody and shoot five different types of cameras and five different types of film, color, black and white, straight neg, cross process, blah, blah, blah. Right. So then all of a sudden, digital comes around and it looks like shit right <laughs> and and everybody's you know and and you know i remember um uh, the guy who used to own sammy's camera a pro camera actually mitch his son and my son were on a, a like a little league team together and mitch would be like look at the pixels look at how sharp this is and look at how clean this is and i'm like but that's exactly what i don't want my photography to look like right. yeah you know and yeah. so when i first started shooting digital I did not want my pictures to look like they were digital photographs. Mm -hmm. And so I spent, this is sort of pre Lightroom, right? Um, this is absolutely pre Lightroom. So nowadays you can do all these effects easily in Lightroom, add a lot of clarity or diffusion or, you know, uh, um, you know, so we were just working in Photoshop and I have a full-time Photoshop guy. And so I just knew that I didn't want my stuff to look like what was coming out of the camera. And I started, we started playing around and we spent six months. Uh, uh, ben Cout is his name. He works for me full-time still. And we spent six months taking digital files and playing around with them in Photoshop to come up with a formula that would be my style, my mm -hmm. look, right? And and we would I'd sit next to them and we would do high pass filters and we would do diffusion filters and we would add noise and grain and we would do all these things, right? And so I started doing that and that became my look and he created like a little action, a Photoshop action where I just kept a little button on my desktop and I would export stuff out of an early version of Lightroom maybe. Um, as a high res JPEG, it didn't work on a low res, right? A high and then I would put them all in a folder and I'd push this button and it would automatically cycle through all the f files in Photoshop as an action and then spit them out and save them as a low res file. And they just had this very cool look to them. They were super high contrast. They looked like they were shot on film. And, and I don't want to claim that I was the first guy ever to do that, but I think that certainly in this like jam band rock and roll world, like nobody else was doing it. Like mm -hmm. I was the guy that was doing that stuff because you couldn't nowadays you go into Lightroom and you're like okay clarity 100 percent you know <laughs> you know yeah you can yeah. get all, you can buy all these presets all right? that time and effort you spent now they, right. they just have presets and, you and when Lightroom first started happening with all of those options and presets that you could buy and stuff like that I remember I had numerous artists come up to me and say oh my god this guy's ripping off your look this guy's copying you and I'm just like well now it's just an idiot thing it's you know you just take a slider right. and you do it yeah you know nobody's working in photoshop these guys don't even know how to use photoshop right these photographers i don't know how to use photoshop personally <laughs> i mean that's what you said you have photoshop guy right i mean i do like i get it i understand it i work with it every day but i'm right. not like i'm i'm not doing the retouching like i've got a guy i'm doing other things right? you're there to right shoot. yeah yeah and yeah. so you know i have a guy that does my retouching but i understand the concept of it and i'm the one who sat with him and said no let's try this let's try that and had like a whole series Series of actions. I mean, we would add noise and then we would take it back out. We would add grain and then take it back out. We would do a high pass filter, which is sort of like a clarity thing, mm -hmm. right? And then we would go back and do another filter over it that was a diffusion, the exact opposite. So your highlights would almost blow out and be like milky, milky smooth, and your shadows and your crevices and your your lines in your face would be deep and rich and thick, right? It was this really, it was this really mind fuck of a of an of an experiment. Very unique, uh -huh. yeah. And, and I, we still have it. And, and, and when he retouches my digital files, like when we do books or we deliver stuff to clients, we are doing all of those filters. He still does all those by hand. Oh, that's brilliant. Okay. Like, I don't know. I know like when I'm pumping stuff out just for social media on my own, I'm like everybody else. I add some clarity and I do this and I add some, you know, add some shadow detail and add a little black and blah, 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 and spit it out and put it on social media. I don't do the whole 
action anymore. Right, yeah. But when he retouch, retouches stuff for books and whatnot, like when you look at the Hippie Chick book, like all of that stuff, every image is retouched in Photoshop mm. by hand, image by image. Mm. And so that's how, you know, that's what I think also, you know, gives me a unique look and is part of what my style is, you know, and he knows and he was there when we invented it together um, before it became, you know, just like a couple of buttons and, and, and sliders, which is what it's become now. And so, but, but that's how we came up with that look and feel. And, and I know that I was doing it before pretty much anybody in the rock world, you know, because it was, I was, it was back when it was still hard. It was still hard. <laughs> it, was it was still, still hard. And I really, do. really, really believed, like, I truly believe that I did not want my pictures to look like everybody else's because right. the, I no longer had all those flavors of film and all those, we all mm-hmm. had the same cameras, the same two or three lenses. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And we were all on the same, you know, the same playing field, so to speak. And so what is going to set you apart? And, you know, it was really interesting because at the time early in the digital revolution, I felt like the most creative post-production people were the wedding photographers, Mm. right? So I had an assistant who was doing some weddings and she had a bunch of friends that were wedding photographers. And and, uh, there was a guy in the East Bay named Maurice Ramirez who was doing cool stuff that I really liked. And uh, and these were just like... um, presets you know these were presets like that that were being marketed to the wedding market right mm-hmm. to wedding photographers you know uh you know add some green to your photo make it look like an old-fashioned polaroid you know right. all, all yeah. those all those presets and i was like and so it was so brand new that everybody wasn't doing it and it wasn't just built into lightroom and i was like this is really cool stuff and of course there were people that were going like way 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 over the top and you probably remember like whatever 5 6 7 8 years ago when some of those plugins came around that made your stuff look like these crazy paintings right oh yeah you know and that uh, you did the hdr stuff yeah the, it was like but it was hdr on steroids yes. yeah and it looked cool for a minute but god and now you look at it and you're like you want to throw up yes yeah, so well it's like somebody ate a whole thing of spree got drunk and then puked it all over the wall right exactly <laughs> so you know, and so, you, you know, look and, and feel and style and texture, it, it all evolves and it all changes. And, you know, technology is the great disruptor. And so yeah. you just have to go with the flow. But we still do, you know, we still hand retouch, you know, like when we shoot album covers, right. and album packages, like, you know, people pick stuff and then we do the retouching. Um, we send it out to retouch or do it in house, but we, you know, everything gets retouched. We're not just sending out files that are processed in Lightroom and delivering that. We're actually doing you know, the work, just like any magazine that's putting up somebody on the cover. And, of course. You know, mm-hmm. every other Photoshop controversy you've read about, you know, on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of covers, I mean, you've done a intimidating number of album covers or at least in the books, the pictures for the booklets and everything. Yeah. So with. I've, I've, I think I have photos in somewhere north of 200 CD packages, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, you damn sure put your mark on the music <laughs> world. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of those could be small baby bands and indie bands mm-hmm. and some of them are more high profile, but um, yeah, I've got a lot of CD covers and, and, and CD packages. Um, I've shot, hundreds i don't even know how many magazine covers right um was it bam magazine you were like yeah uh, staff photographer yeah so bam while, right? magazine was a a, a newsprint based stapled you know staple folded uh music magazine in the bay area and i became their chief photographer in the late 80s and shot i don't know 50 60 70 covers for them chili peppers uh jane's addiction uh john doe you know ice tea um, oh, know, that picture. Primus. Yeah. So there's this, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I did a lot of covers for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, in the go go 90s, the dot com 90s, starting in about 95. Um, so I used to advertise in a source book called the alternative pick. You guys know what the workbook is and the black book, right? Yeah, so these are heard, source yeah. books where, you know, photographers take out a full page or a two page spread. You showcase your best photography, you pay them thousands of dollars, and then they take those books and they send them to art directors and art buyers and photo editors. And it's like a marketed know. portfolio. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. a, but you know, and, and it's sort of, it's divided up maybe by region. Like the mm-hmm. workbook might be like the East coast, the West coast, the Northeast, the South, you know, there's, so it so, puts you in your market. Market. Yeah, so if you're looking for a photographer in the, in in San Francisco, you know, or the, you know, they can go to that section and then they could see, okay, well, here's 20 food photographers, but I need to shoot a portrait. Here's 20 car photographers, but I need to shoot a portrait. Oh, here are the 20 portrait photographers. Right. And then they can call in portfolios and stuff like that. And so the alternative pick was uh was was designed and developed by a woman who I think actually maybe I don't know if she ever lived in San Francisco. I feel like Julie Juliet did. But anyway, um 
uh, I started advertising the alternative pick and that was sort of geared towards hipper magazines and record companies and hipper ad agencies. And my stuff was like, you know, a little bit crazy looking and, and art directors for like some of the computer magazines, like, uh, the red herring and business 2.0 and, and info world. There were all these trade magazines that were covering the dot com boom of San Francisco starting in 95. And uh, they started seeing my work in the alternative pick because the alternative pick was sending the book to those people. And they started hiring me to shoot portraits of these people like they were rock stars. Mm -hmm. So like I'd go down and I would do a portrait of some guy. He's like, I'm going to be a billionaire. I'm starting a new company called coffee.com and I'm going to sell coffee beans on the internet. You know, I mean, <laughs> coffee with one E. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, my studio was at ninth and Folsom on the corner of my studio was Petopia or uh, uh, Petopia.com and pets.com. Remember those two companies uh -huh. were around the yeah. corner. Yeah. And so I like, I mean, on a daily basis, we were doing, uh, you know, editorial jobs for all these computer and business magazines that were covering the dot com in industry. And their magazines were, you know, three, 400 pages thick because there were so much advertising in it so i would i and at the same like time GQ. i got my i got my first advertising rep here in the city so i was shooting ad campaigns editorial features and magazine covers and and shooting rock and roll pa cd packages and magazine stories and online stories was brand new and and shooting rock and roll at night we were doing three day three jobs a day hmm. some days you know we'd go we'd go down to silicon valley and shoot a company for like a magazine story right we do a portrait and they'd be like hey do you do headshots? We just hired 25 new people. I'm like, yeah. They're like, how much? I'm like, thousand dollars a head. They're like, oh, great. Can you come down on Wednesday and shoot 25 people? Okay. <laughs> That's what it was like in 96 and 97 in the Bay Area. And then two weeks later, they call you up and like, hey, we hired 25 more people. Can you come down and do that again? That's what the economy was like in the Bay Area from like 96 to, to 2000. Holy yeah. shit. Right? It was yeah. out of control. There was so much photography work. It was just ridiculous. Right? Uh -huh. And so. Now it's like, can you just come over and do it for a friend? <laughs> right. Free. Yeah, exactly. You have a digital camera. Can, <laughs> yeah. Can you, shoot, yeah. can you do a headshot for me? I need for my LinkedIn page on your on your iPhone. Crazy. So So like I remember going down and doing portraits where I'd bring my 4x5 camera down. And I would set it up and I would do a portrait of somebody just shooting four by five Polaroid. And well, we'd that's right. You're doing four by five. Right. Yeah. And we'd pull the Polaroid and we'd leave all the rough edges around it uh -huh. in color. And this is not this is not even type 55, which was a negative film. Right. You know, Polaroid type mm -hmm. 55, positive, negative mm -hmm. gave you. A ne and I shot a lot of that. But we were just shooting just straight positive po Polaroid four by five. And we'd shoot a bunch of portraits and I'd stick them in a FedEx envelope and I'd FedEx them to the magazine. I'd be like here's your art. And they would scan it with all the rough everything yeah. showing. And that, and that's what they would run as a full page story uh, as the artwork. And they loved it. it they looks loved great, it. Though, edgy, they, you know, yes. that kind of edgy feel. Yeah. And I, I think it gives yeah. it something you know, special. I'd yeah. go out and I'd shoot like a portrait of somebody using the half frame camera. And I would do like the half face and the full face. I'd pull back and do two, three frames and I was shooting Chrome film. And then when I'd get it back from the lab, I would cut it up into strips that would have two frames together or four or six or eight or as much as 10. Cause 10 frames is, five 35 millimeter frames and that's what would fit in my neg sleeves right hmm. and so i'd send them that as finished art and they would take the whole strip and they would scan it or when we started scanning stuff i would scan the frames that i want i'd piece them together in photoshop to make up my collages right and that's what i would send them as final art uh -huh. right and so i was just sending them like all the, doing all this crazy stuff i would doing portraits and i'd cross process them and i would send them a pr an eight by ten print and it would be all like you know super saturated colors and you know i'd shoot these guys in server rooms right with all this like you know hardware mm -hmm. yeah. and i'd light it with like a million gels and make it like purple and red and green and blue and orange and you know and with him like lit normally just like with a warming gel on him and he would just pop out of this stuff and you know and 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 then i was and i was also just sort of like the my style. I was like the master of the fisheye, right? I had a fisheye lens for my Hasselblad and a fisheye lens for my 35 millimeter camera. And, uh, and I would be doing these portraits of people like right like up to their face with a fisheye. So their faces were like these yeah. giant like fish balls, like these bulbs, right? You know, and, and, you know, the magazines loved it. You know, they were all about like the weirder, the better from like 95 to 2000. Get like, away from the normal. Right. And, uh, and I just was, and I was shooting every day, two, three, four jobs a day. No kidding. Just like nonstop. Wow. Nonstop. That's uh, back when work was uh, yeah. Yeah, plentiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which so, you can still find it today as long as you look for it. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's harder. It's harder. It's though. harder to find. It was, you know, back then to get like the big ad jobs that had like the 20, 30, 40, $50,000 budget budgets, you know, you had to win the lottery. Yeah. Like, you know, first you had to get your portfolio called in by the ad agency. 
and by the art buyer. And then she'd show to the art director who would then, you know, there might be 20 portfolios and then they would narrow it down to five or three. And then they'd go to those three or five people and say, um, uh, can you, you know, here's the comp. Can you give me your creative brief on it? And then they would, you know, narrow it down to two. And then they'd say, can you give us an estimate on it? And then we'd estimate it. And then it was, you know, then somebody got the job. Right. But, it's like winning the lottery, mm -hmm. you know, it's not right. an easy task. And so it's, it, you know, and then when nine 11 hit and all that ad work dried up, you know, because there was a lot of advertising work that was for trade magazines that had budgets that were maybe like 10, 15, $20,000 a day. These weren't like the Andy Leibowitz ad jobs that were a million dollars or a half a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. But there was a lot of these jobs that were like 10 grand a day, 15 grand a day, stuff like that, because they were paying for your time and the usage. Okay. We're going to run ads on these photos for mm -hmm. For right, a year, yeah. we're going to pit buy, you know, that's a market buy. Yeah, right. it's a market buy, right? And so we were, you know, we were estimating stuff like that, but there was a lot of jobs in that area. And we were competing with like this, you know, I want to call us like mid range photographers. We weren't like the, you know, the Annie Leibowitzes or the Stephen Mizells or, you know, uh, uh, you know, big name shooters or even the RJ Munas of San Francisco, who was the, one of the most brilliant San Francisco advertising photographers. And uh, so we were, you know, they were competing for these jobs that were 100 and 200 and 300 and 400. Hundred and five hundred thousand dollars, and we were competing for these jobs that were five or eight or ten or fifteen or twenty thousand. There was a, a pool of us, mm -hmm. you know, and that's who we were competing against for those kinds of jobs, right? And so now there's just almost you know so few jobs like that. Now those jobs that were fifteen or twenty thousand dollars twenty years ago, fifteen years ago, those same jobs are five thousand dollars or yeah. seven thousand dollars, right? Or if they're willing to accept a mediocre photograph it's five hundred dollars <laughs> yeah i remember i had an, an art director friend call me once and she said she said i've got a i've got a, a job i need to sell i, I have a, like a client who's got like a digital pen and we want to create a photo library we want you to hire a hand model or two you know guy and a gal or you know whatever the demographic was and we're going to do all these different shots of them you know writing on a tablet and then writing on this and you know close up of the pen and close up of the hand and different angles and blah blah you know we need 10 shots or whatever it is 20 shots you know we want to use them for the web and we want to use them for this and collateral and so on and so forth and i'm like well what's your budget and she said i got seventy five hundred dollars i'm like great so i came in at like Seven thousand dollars. So I'm like, okay, I'll come in at seven because I know I'll get the other extra five hundred out of them for something else, retouching or something. But we'll have to spend it on mm -hmm. anyway, right? And then uh, I didn't get the job, right? And I said she was a good friend of mine, and she sadly passed away a few years ago. And uh, um, I said, what did the job go for? And she said it went for twenty five hundred dollars. <laughs> And I said, I said, so, so the problem with that is, is that first of all, that client will never give her a $7,500 budget again. Okay. Right. That, that job, that photographer who was probably very qualified, maybe even more qualified than me to shoot that. Cause that's not really my specialty, but I could have done it. And I know how to light it and I know how to shoot it and everything else. Um, is that that photographer left $5,000 on the table mm -hmm. that he sh should have gotten. Yeah. yeah. And that's why you can't stay in business doing stuff like that. And yeah. that's what young photographers need to understand is that you have to, you know, even if you're, even if you're right out of college, if you're a really brilliant photographer and you're bidding on a brilliant job that you're qualified to do because creatively you can do that job, you shouldn't be billing, bidding it at a 10th of what it's going for because you're a new photographer and you have less overhead. Mm -hmm. You should still be bidding it at the same price. Mm -hmm. Have some respect for yourself yeah. as a right. professional too. And, and the whole photographic market because it lowers it for everybody. So like I said, that client will never spend $7,500 mm -hmm. on a photo shoot again. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so, you know, and that's the kind of stuff that we were running into like on a regular basis is that, you know, jobs were going for a lot less than what they were meant to meant to be going for and what they were worth and it's just you know it, it's frustrating and it made it difficult to make a living you know after post 9 11 yeah mm -hmm. wow and i just want to kind of pivot real quick we were you were talking about your portraits and everything while ago um and and leaving those borders and i know many of the images that i've been looking at yours uh the, the tom waits the jerry garcia um neil young did you get a chance during the shoots to, to get to know any of these people or like Tom Waits, for instance, I always found well, very fascinating. Sure. Person. So, um, you do get to know their personality a little bit. Of course it helps that I'm a big music fan mm -hmm. and that I know their music and I know that, but, but 
So all the guys that you just named, right? These are all guys that at this point have been in the music business for 50 years, 40 mm-hmm. years, 30 years, right? And even when I shot Waits, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, he had already been in the music business for 20 or 25 right. years. So I'm going into this job, into this portrait session, thinking I need to make the most brilliant portrait I can possibly make. <laughs> yeah. Because A, I want to be creative, and B, because it makes me feel good, and that's what my job is to to make a really great portrait and B if I don't do a brilliant portrait, I'm not going to get hired next time by this art director or photo editor or whatever. Right. So, you know, I, I need to produce. Right. And so now Neil Young comes to that photo shoot and it's a cover shoot for the, you know, pulse magazine, I think was my first cover shoot with Neil in 91. Uh, Pulse magazine was a magazine that was put out by tower records. Remember tower records, Mm -hmm. tower pulse magazine. And, uh, and I wanted to make a brilliant portrait of Neil and Neil was giving me 10 minutes to do it. Oh, what? Okay. And, and, and that very first shoot that I did with him, uh, I have actually have a picture of Neil holding his wrist up and pointing at his watch. Like, you're done, dude. Right. And so it's oh, like wow. me and an assistant and and we're in Neil Young's at his down at his ranch and I'm doing a portrait of him. And I got all my lighting set up and I, you know, shot mostly I think I shot all two and a quarter, not even any 35 millimeter on that setup. And, uh, you know, shot some black and white and shot some color. And he's like, I'm done. And then he we, and then he went outside to do the interview with the writer, and they were talking. And I said, while they were sitting on a pile of, of firewood, I said, "Can I get a couple more shots?" He's like, "Sure." And so I actually brought some lighting outside, and I set up another portrait, and I did another portrait of him outside that he actually gave me like another five minutes, right? And so a lot of artists like that, you know, my most iconic shot of Jerry Garcia that'll be in the show, um, that that shot was done in under three minutes because the publicist was forcing me out of the room and I was shooting him in a room that was smaller than this room that we're in right now. I was sitting on the desk and he was sitting like right in front of me. I had to shoot, you know, it was literally, Holy I think shit. I, I mean, and I went there like, Oh my God, this is my first portrait with Jerry Garcia. I'm going to be brilliant. I'm going to bring in my studio lighting. I'm going to shoot with my Hasselblad, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I, and I was still, I, I'd only been shooting with a Hasselblad for two years at that point. And I didn't even break the Hasselblad out. I had it all loaded up with film. But basically, because they gave me like three minutes to shoot, I just shot, I think, um, two rolls of 35 millimeter film with a motor drive as fast as I could. Boom. Done. Wow. Still pulling a trigger as they're pushing you out the door. Pretty much. You know? <laughs> and so so these guys, you know, in that case, it was the publicist who wanted, you know, was was protecting Jerry. But a lot of these guys, they just want to go have a turkey sandwich and eat lunch. And I want yeah. I want to make a brilliant photograph and they just want to get out because they've already done this 500 times yeah. and over. And they know they're going to have 500 more right. of them to go. Yeah. And but like, you know, when I worked with Carlos Santana, I did the, fo- the photo shoot for his Supernatural record. I hung out with him at his house. We had lunch together. He told us some great stories about being at Woodstock and his guitar melting in his hands and things like that, you know, because he was on drugs. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. You know, and, 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 uh, but you know, it's funny, but so I did the photos for the supernatural record. I had the back cover photo, which was a live performance shot, but I did all the portraits that were going to be used for publicity and advertising and marketing. And we went up to his house in San Rafael and we shot him for, you know, an hour or two in the morning broke for lunch and then around two o'clock in the afternoon he goes i gotta leave and go pick up my son at the golden gate bridge because his son salvador santana went to school in san francisco at the school of the arts right Mm -hmm. soda and i said all right great so you'll be back in about an hour and we'll you know i've got like three more setups i want to do he's like no no we're done right and that was his biggest selling record ever 50 million copies they probably could have used all the photos they you know they could have used all the photos they could have we could have gotten at that particular you know, session, but he was done, you know, but we hung out with him for four hours and, and, and they approved like something like 60 photos from that photo shoot. I've never had an artist approve that many photos from one photo shoot, which was great because also the record company didn't do it as a buyout with me. They did it as a straight publicity um, usage for me. So I owned all those photos and every time they needed a photo, they had to come back and pay me more money. And and, 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 and so that was like very lucrative on a licensing front because there was a bunch of ad campaigns because it was the beginning of the dot com movement. There were all these new Latino websites. You got very fortunate. I got very fortunate. And and at the end of the day, you know, I probably got paid, you know, whatever it was, three, four thousand dollars, five thousand dollars to do the publicity shoot. But I think in licensing, there was well over a hundred thousand dollars by the end of the day. 
Beautiful. You know, so because there were, and those were, these were all, and that wasn't the record company paying. These were like third party people that needed to license photos. Right. Publishers. You know, and for ad campaigns. And, yeah. And uh -huh. there was just like a lot of different cool stuff. And they just kept referring it back to me, referring it back to me, you know, because I had the photos and I had all the approved photos. Gee. <laughs> well, sp well, now that we're talking about Carlos and, and Jerry, let's, this might be a good time to talk about the show coming yes. up here. Let's jump over to that. Sure. Yeah. So um, I met Dave Christensen who's the curator of the Harvey Milk Photo Center uh, when there was a show here called The Art of Fire. Yeah. Uh, a guy named Dwayne Newton. Dwayne Newton, a good friend of uh, right. ours, yeah. Uh, he was on your show. Uh, Dwayne was the curator, brought that show to the, to the center here. And uh, there was an article that ran in the San Francisco Chronicle that said, uh, photo show, crowdsourcing photos from anybody who has pictures of fires in San Francisco. And about a year before that, a house burned down on my block, about three, four doors down. A, a giant mega fire it was a house under construction, you know, very controversial. Um, and, and I ran out with my camera and got incredible photographs of this house burning down mm. with the fire department. I mean, the fire department used photos for their union newsletter. Wow. And, That's what know, photographers do. You run yeah. through right? the fire. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I shot some video and my video was on, uh, uh, channel two, four, five, seven and Telemundo, you know, like by the time they had their camera crews there, they're like, the flames were like an inch high. <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, Hey, you want some footage? They're like, do you have flames? I'm like, oh yeah, I have flames. <laughs> That's some blaze, right? Going and on. I had, I already had my assistant like burning DVDs with like movie MOV files, right? And I handed them out to all the news crews, and it was like, you know, every news channel, you know, courtesy Jay Blakesburg, right? It's very uh -huh. funny, right? So anyway, so I answered Dwayne's ad and or, or, or article. I emailed him. I sent him some photos, and he's like, you're the first person to respond, and you are absolutely in this show, <laughs> right? So he, so he, so I come down to see the show. I think I was out of town when they actually had the opening but I wanted to see the show and I came down and met Dwayne here one day and Dave was there and Dwayne had said hey this guy's coming down and he's this rock and roll photographer and Dave's like I want to do a rock and roll show mm -hmm. and so uh, Dave and I started talking I left him a couple copies of my book or books some different books and we just started talking and I said uh, you know let's and this was probably about a I can think this is about a year ago mm -hmm. it sounds about right yeah, yeah. yeah. about a year ago and uh, and I basically said you know, let's do it in November. Um, you know, the, the, the Thursday, the second week in, in November. And he was like, okay, I'll pencil it in. And then we started talking more and more and more about it. And so I'm kind of, you know, and I haven't really, I've done a few small little baby exhibits in San Francisco at some, some film labs. I did a couple and I did one when I had my first Grateful Dead book came out. We hung some photos in a place where we did a book release party. Uh, but this is really my first big, big photo exhibition. And I'm calling oh. it a career retrospective, even though my career's not over. Right. Um, it's, you know, it's my, my career. At least I hope it's There's not. no gravestone out front. Right. So. No, no. It's funny when we were, when, when Casper was helping me make the, the flyers for the, for the exhibition, um, we had like the dates, you know, like uh, 1978 to 2017. I'm like, it just looks like that was when I was born and that's when I died. <laughs> I know? swear to God, he yeah. sent the draft back and I was like, oh my God, it does look like a gravestone. Right. And so we changed it to a photographic exhibit in 1978 <laughs> yeah. or photographs, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so there's photos going back from when I first started and, um, you know, we're going to fill those walls. Um, Metal prints too, right? Yeah. And oh. so uh, and I'll tell you that in a second. So about that in a second. But um, I guess there was a skateboard show here, which I didn't see. Shutter speed. But yeah. apparently they had like floor to ceiling photographs everywhere. And right. I, and, and I was out of town when it was, when it was happening. It's like and 300 was, pieces. I yeah. Think. And so I'm going to try and show about 125 pieces and, uh, and they're all metal. And, uh, the way that came about, I don't know if you've seen metal prints, but mm -hmm. they're like very vibrant. Right. Or yeah. You know, it's like this. It's an interesting process that I've now learned about. Uh, but I had connected with a lab down in Louisiana and right outside of New Orleans in Metairie. Mm -hmm. And this guy's a deadhead. And we did a barter like two years ago. And he showed me a metal. It was the first metal prints that I had really ever seen. And I'm like, this is cool. But when I started looking into how much it was going to cost to frame these photographs, <laughs> Um, I realized, okay, this is going to be a problem, yeah. right? Because it was like yeah. $15,000 to frame the photographs that were going to cost $5,000 to make. Oh, right? oh okay. Sounds about right. So, um, uh, and unfortunately, I can't, couldn't really afford that. And so I started talking to this guy about doing metal prints because you don't have to frame them. And then uh, David Gidry is his name, the guy down at, in, at the lab in Louisiana. And then he connected me to a guy named Steve Flores, who... Um, works in a company called Chromalux, and Chromalux makes the metal plates. 
and they signed on as a sponsor and they donated all the metal wow. for my show. Yeah. So I'm super grateful so great. to, nice. to, to Chroma Lux. Super, super grateful to them for, you know, believing in this show and believing in me and supporting photography and supporting Harvey Milk Photo Center. They're going to make a color brochure for the show that they're going to have on hand so people can take with them. Um, and they gave us all the metal. And so I'm still paying the production costs on all of this because there's costs involved, ink and whatnot mm-hmm. and labor. And, um, and then we're going to just hang them and they're all going to just be floating about an inch off the wall with these wooden backs and they look amazing. He's, we, we did some samples and he sent me a few just to see, I've got about 10 or 12 of them at my house, but there's another hundred, there's 150 photos total that we're printing. There's also going to be a little satellite exhibit at the McLaren lodge. So the Harvey milk photo center hangs art in the McLaren lodge, which is a historic building where the, uh, rec and park offices are in San mm-hmm. Francisco at the, at the beginning of golden gate park of, at fell street. And uh, we're doing a little exhibit there of about, I don't know, a dozen or so prints that were all things that I've shot in Golden Gate Park. So Hardly Strictly Bluegrass and the Tibet Freedom Concert and uh, just a bunch of different things that I've shot over the years in the park at the Band Shell or the Polo Fields or, you know, Sharon Meadow or uh, uh, the the Beach Chalet. There's shots from all over Golden Gate Park and uh-huh. that's what's going to be showing there at McLaren. And we're not going to do an opening or a party there, but, you know, it's a historic place. A lot of visitors come in there and check out the building because it's a historic building. It- uh, but back at Harvey Milk, so that's going to leave us about 135 to about 135 images to try and hang at Harvey Milk, and I hope I can hang them all. I just told Dave I'm taking over the whole <laughs> front area where they do all the, you know, where all the people yep, sit. Yep, a, right. Yeah. A, I said I'm taking the over lobby. The, the lobby. I said I'm taking over these walls as well. I wasn't originally, but I'm like now I'm taking over these walls. <laughs> well, what's great is you have that lobby area. You also have the hallway, right? Um, and that entryway into the large gallery space. Right. I, if if you ha- it, for our listeners out there, if you haven't been to the Harvey Milk Photo Center, it is a wonderful gallery space. But there's also you have a uh, where there's opening night, the opening reception on the 9th there on November, and then you also have a lecture coming up. Yes. Um, so we're going to do that on the 11th. So the opening uh, exhibit, open to the public, please come on down, it will be November uh, 9th from 5.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. And that's uh, here at the Harvey Milk Photo Center, yep. which is 50 Scott Street. 50 yep. Scott Street. Uh-huh. And might I add, you never know who you might see. During right. that uh, event, too. Yep. So. yep, it's going to be a fun event. And we've got some people. we got Lagunitas Brewery bringing in some beer for us. And we got Hartford Wines bringing in some wine for oh, us. Man. Hey, hey, hey. So, yep, so. <laughs> it's not a rock show without a little bit of yep, uh, so, you know, imbibing. So I'm grateful to those, those folks for helping out. And then... Um, on the 11th, at 11 a.m., we're going to do a lecture slideshow. I do a presentation that I've been doing around the country for the last few years called Chasing the Light, the Rock and Roll Photography of Jay Blakesburg. And it's me basically narrating a slideshow of my work as well as sort of my story about how I got from point A as a 15-year-old loser stoner boy in suburban New Jersey in 1977 <laughs> to uh, where I am in 2017, 40 years later, uh, Taking that iconic photo <laughs> at right. Soldier Field. Exactly. <laughs> so that's so those are the two big things that I have coming up. Uh, now, where's the lecture going to be? Is it going to be here, here, Harvey, Milk, or here Harvey Milk, too? The, okay. the, I think they call it the ballroom. In the ballroom. Okay. It's the big room. Uh, Ups, where it, Upstairs. Upstairs. If you were at Street Photo, that's where Bruce Gilden and all of them had spoke. But um, as of, of hearing this show, um, we're hoping that there's still some some openings. This is a registration only. Yeah, it's so you got to go to the Harvey Milk uh, Photo Center website, which is, what's that website? Uh, uh, that's going to be harveymilkphotocenter.org. And uh, right from the front page, you'll see a link to, to take you right to the dark and light uh, 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 show the event page and then from there there's a registration link yep so you need to RSVP in advance I think to. I think we have a room for about 200 people yeah uh, so yeah and, and it's about a about a 90 minute event all in with Q&A and whatnot so mm-hmm. oh man I better uh, give myself a registered on it yeah day. man oh yeah yeah oh you're good we got you oh we got <laughs> oh okay good 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 uh, so yeah so those two things and then uh, this new Grateful Dead book uh, that I was talking about earlier um, uh you can also uh, go right – if you want to pre-order that book now, you can go to our www.eyesoftheworldbook.com. Eyesoftheworldbook.com. You can pre-order the Grateful Dead book, get signed copies there, see some sample pages. And that book comes out at the end of October. And I think we're going to do an event up at Terrapin Crossroads uh, in San Rafael, a little book release party on November 30th in the evening. Uh, we'll have some live music. And uh, that's at Phil Lesh from the Grateful Dead's nightclub up in San Rafael, Terrapin Crossroads on November 30th. So, Sweet. And uh, then you had the one on October 28th. Yeah, and then we have one on October 28th in New York City at the Morrison Hotel Gallery. So come and check that out. Uh, but, yeah. 
eyes of the world book.com. You can see some samples of that book and rockoutbooks.com to see some of my other books. And, um, yeah, so that's what's coming up in my world in terms of that. I'm super excited about this gallery exhibit. I'm yeah. working on writing captions now and, uh, um, getting the title cards together. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then that's, that's 130 uh, plus. I'm, I'm just trying to imagine that in the gallery space, it's going to be just an overwhelming amount of just star power just looking oh, down man, on you. Yeah, Actually, yeah. That, that, that does lead to a question. I'm curious, after near 40 years of, of documenting so many notable names, um, do you find it difficult to be starstruck anymore, or do you still kind of get that? Well, I, I don't think, you know, I've kind of have never really been starstruck, mm-hmm. or at least throughout my career, because you just can't be. Um, to do what I do, but I still respect these people and I'm just in awe of these people and I'm in awe when I get to photograph these people because I think that they've made such a huge contribution to pop culture history and if it's shooting musicians, then it's obviously with music, but uh, again, it's brilliant art inspiring people to be brilliant and inspiring people to be passionate and inspiring people to um, get out of their houses and get out of their you know living room chairs where they're just sitting there watching TV, although there is great TV on these days. There's so much amazing TV. It's, oh, that, you know what that, yeah, you're right. It's, That's, it's that on, was another discussion. It's a, yeah, it's another discussion. <laughs> but still, <laughs> like, you know, get out. And, and I always say that, you know, we are the sum of our experiences, mm. right? And so by putting yourself in different places with different people and interacting with people and talking to people, you have these experiences. Like I'm hoping that, you know, for me, this is an interesting experience that I can hold on to for a long time talking to you guys and hopefully you feel the same way about talking oh, to me. Oh, definitely. Like, I mean, you guys didn't really know much about me before this, but now you probably know a lot about me. And yeah. you're like, wow, that Plus was- Plus my uh, research. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, and I'm hoping that you're like, okay, this was fascinating, right? This is like a fascinating story. And I'm hoping that that, you know, you take that with you and that becomes part of your life. Things that I say become things that you want to say because yes. you were like, you know, it helps. There's that sharing of culture we were yeah. talking about a while ago. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, I, you know, come to my exhibit and mingle with, you know, I'm hoping there's going to be a few hundred people there that like live music and that like photography and that you can, you know, maybe you've never seen before and never met and you'll meet new people and you'll, you'll, you'll mingle and you'll have fun and you'll have an interesting conversation conversations that will enrich your life right so that's you know let's all come together and do th- things to have experiences mm-hmm. right my experiences revolve around photography and live music and travel and things like that and um you know we didn't even get into like any of my personal photography which i don't do a ton of right because i feel like it's all there but like last year i went to cuba and i shot almost everything i shot not everything but almost everything with a brand new 105 14 like yeah. lens that i bought oh. so even when i was shooting like in bright daylight like you know blazing middle of the day di- sunlight i was still shooting at 14 or 18 right and i was shooting at like the lowest wow. iso i could go down to <laughs> yeah. and shooting it at the, uh, the like 8000th of yeah, a second like it was yeah. more like 2500th of a uh-huh. second you know that's about where it was uh-huh. um at like iso minus you know uh, iso 32 it's you know 64 minus the three you know the three stops you yeah. can go lower and um and so everything is shot at like this 1418 and it's just it's cube. It just looks unbelievable, mm-hmm. right? It's just unbelievable. Because We've got to have this guy on again. We are, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because we, we focus so much this, into man. the music stuff. Yeah, we, we, have, we have this. This is like a four hour. This this is a Peter Jackson <laughs> type of episode. It needs to be. Yeah. Right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> There's another aspect of him, man. Right. I yeah. You. I mean, I love photography, and I love good photography, and I love looking at other people's good photography, and I love being inspired by other people's good photography, and I look at all sorts of stuff. I just saw the Irving Penn exhibit in New York. Um, Irving was a big inspiration of mine for portraiture Mm -hmm. Uh, more so than Avedon although I love Richard Avedon's work as well but um, I I saw a pen exhibit a number of years ago and I love you know his coffee table book passages which is one of my favorites oh that's a great book yeah and so you know Irving has always been so I went and saw that at the Met in early summer right a couple days before it closed and so uh, and I go to the MoMA here in San Francisco. They have a great new photography wing that's got so much great stuff in it. Um, I love going to the, like the whole third floor now. Yeah. yeah, Walker Evans is coming to the MoMA. Walker Evans oh, is nice. coming. Yeah. Jim Marshall just uh, has an event going over mm-hmm. in Leica Store. Yep, yep. And so, and Marshall's a huge influence of mine yeah. and a big inspiration. And I actually help um, help with the Jim Marshall estate. I do, um, do, you I, really? I do work with the Jim Marshall estate. I help oh, them okay. with a lot of their digital production. I do all the scanning for the estate. And, uh, and I handle all the licensing for the Jim Marshall estate. So I've got a, a, a pretty good idea of what Jim's body of work looks like. I've mm-hmm. looked, wow. at, looked at a lot of proof sheets. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> I am very green with envy on that. Uh-huh. How long have you been working with that? Uh, uh, since about six months after he passed away. Really? Yeah. 
So we did a, the Marshall Estate did a book called The Hate on the Hate Ashbury, and we looked through 3,000 proof sheets of his work that were taken from 64 to 68 mm -hmm. in San Francisco. Were you just close with the family or with Jim and the family uh, beforehand? Or? Uh, Jim had no family. Um, uh, I'm f good friends with the woman who owns his estate, and I was good friends with Jim. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, you know, Jim was a complicated character, and and uh, but at the end of his life, we were pretty tight, and we did a cool project together. He helped fund a book uh, for one of his best friends, who was a street photographer named Barry Shapiro. And uh, I'll, I'll remind me to get you guys copies of this book. It's called A Dangerously Curious Eye, and basically, it was this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this guy named Barry Shapiro, who was a, a school teacher, a photographer, and a drug dealer. Mm, and, there's uh, a mix for you. Right. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and what Barry's job was is that he was teaching illiterate um, adults, mm. how to re mostly black men, how to read and write in San Francisco through UCSF Medical Center. And he got a call from UCSF and I think it was like 70 or 71, and said, we have a guy who wants to learn how to read and write. He lives in Hunter's Point, and he's too embarrassed to come into the hospital. He wants you to come to him at Hunter's Point. And Barry Shapiro went to Hunter's Point and stayed there for nine years with the Leica. Wow. Holy shit. Wow. And I made a, and Jim, he died of cancer. Barry died of cancer in his early 60s, and Jim brought me to his family, and we published a book of his work. That's mind-blowing. Yeah. Mind-blowing. Yeah, I got to see that. And that's called Dangerously, a Dangerously Curious Eye? Dangerously Curious Eye. Uh huh. Wow. Mm -hmm. And um, the show notes of this episode can, is going to be can, a mile long, right? And, and, <laughs> and you can see that book on my website, the rockoutbooks.com website. Oh, it's on there. Okay. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. And so I published that book. And Jim Marshall, in a grand gesture in his life, he came to me and said, "You have to publish a book of this guy's work." You know, this was my really dear friend. And Jim gave me ten thousand dollars, no questions asked. Right? It cost about thirty thousand dollars to self-publish a book, between thirty and thirty-five thousand. That sounds about right. Yeah. And um, and I think we did this for thirty. And Jim gave me ten, and his Barry's family put up five, and I put up the other fifteen as a favor to Marshall, um, with the agreement that I would be the first one to recoup my money. Right? Because mm -hmm. I was, and I was, and we did. You know, I mean, nobody really made money, but this book got out there, and people, everybody got repaid, which was great. Uh, but it's an incredible body of work. And so the book is in two parts. The whole first point part is Hunter's Point, And the whole second part is called, I think, Through the Window. And he used to just drive around the Bay Area, East Bay, San Francisco, in his VW bus, his 60-something micro bus, and just shoot street scenes out the window of his bus. And you can see the frame of the bus window and everything, and it's brilliant. That's yeah. the whole second half of the book. Wow. But he also, before he moved to the Bay Area, Barry Shapiro shot down in Los Angeles and documented the birth of the modern-day skateboard movement is that right uh, in long beach and also the mo uh the whole um boardwalk carnival late 60s crowd you know winning prizes going to the boardwalk and so mm -hmm. he has a whole body of work and i'm pretty sure they donated his whole archive now to uc berkeley school of journalism is where it resides now oh um, that means ken wow. light's got his hand on all <laughs> yeah. that yeah yeah <laughs> i'm pretty sure ken is yeah ken's involved uh who, who we're talking about here he's uh i think director of the j school over there now he is the he? director of the journalism yeah. school at uc berkeley he's a renowned photographer in his own right i bought his last book which was about the 60s and stuff like that and yeah. uh uh, I've always been a fan of Ken Light's work. And what's that, he's what's good, going on, right? That's the name of that book. I think book. that sounds yeah, what's yeah, going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, it's for the, yeah. our listeners, yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, but yeah, he's got a great body of work, and he started as a teenager, and yep. you know Kent State and the whole thing, and so he's you know he was he was there, and uh, and really does have a good good strong body mm -hmm. of work. I really appreciate uh, Ken's work a lot. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I got, uh, I, unfortunately, I know for, for time constraints, we got to let you go. Otherwise, you'll be editing this this, this thing for uh, like days. I'm just, I'll do this <laughs> shit unedited. Roll, man. be two hours of audio, and <laughs> yeah. I don't give a shit what anybody says. <laughs> 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 Deal with it. There's a pause button. Right. Um, Jim's got one question he's got to throw your way, though. Well, you know what? I kind of feel silly about asking because this man has been living this question <laughs> right. his whole life. But the question is, basically, if you could shoot at any time during the inception of the camera, you know, what what would you be shooting? Wow. What? So, you know, uh, I guess my heart and soul tells me because I'm a music photographer that I would have been standing next to Jim Marshall and shooting, you know, in the Haight Ashbury starting in the, in the mid sixties. Um, am I allowed to bring any technology back with me? Yes. Yeah. Do whatever <laughs> fits into the time machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, but I also would, I would love to go and shoot the civil war. 
Ah, is that right? You know, I would love to be. I would love to do like I would. You want to go but old I, school, but I don't want to. But I don't want to bring a digital camera to the Civil War. I want to bring my Hasselblad with like studio lighting to the Civil War. Uh, you know, the American West. You know, portraits of Jesse James or you know uh-huh. Sitting Bull or. There you go. You know, stuff yeah. like that. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the Civil War or, you know, document the building of the railroad. You could almost link this to rock and roll. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, the kind of the rough edges, you know, the the, the rough and tumble time of this of right. the centuries. You, mm-hmm. know, you know, I just don't want to like... be dipping glass plates in chemistry and. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You don't want to do that. I want my Hasselblad and some roll film. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Well, awesome. Well, Definitely. Thank you for coming on. Now, uh, where is the best place for people to go and find your work online? Uh, Instagram at Jay Blakesburg, B-L-A-K-E-S-B-E-R-G. On Facebook at Jay Blakesburg Photography. I don't post anything on my quote unquote personal page, which is just Jay Blakesburg. So go to my photography page and my website's Blakesburg.com. But I post a lot of archival stuff on social media. So, you know, I mean, if you want to go down a rabbit hole and just click on my timeline, you could just see stuff. You could probably spend a four days to get through those six yeah. or 8,000 mm-hmm. photos that are up there. Yeah. Cool. And talk, right. talk about your, um, your publishing company again. Yeah. So, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, that. rock out books. Um, I self published pretty much all my books. I've done, uh, 13 coffee table books and two of them have been with other publishers. Uh, but, uh, so rockoutbooks.com and I, you know, I'm always looking for cool projects too. I also do book packaging, right? So book packaging is helping other people self-publish their books. So we can do anything mm-hmm. from the from d- the design to the pre-press to the printing to shipping, customs, cargo, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I typically don't publish other people's books anymore. Like it's a very complicated thing to do um, in this day and age. Um but I did the Marshall book, you know, mm-hmm. with Barry Shapiro. The um, right project comes up. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I did another one. Uh, this is a cool project. About 10 years ago, I did a book called The San Francisco Love Affair. I read an obituary in the Chronicle about a photographer named Gene Wright. Looked him up online and found nothing. Contacted his widow, lived in Walnut Creek, a couple, six months later. And over the course of a year, we became friends. And I published a book. And Gene shot with a not a wide lux but a noblex which is the same thing it's a two and a quarter version of a panoramic camera mm-hmm. and he all in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s he walked around san francisco and did panoramic two and a quarter photos of san francisco hmm. and his work was brilliant and we and on his deathbed he asked his wife if she could do a book and his wife was about 20 years younger than him and we published this book and it came out right around now, a little bit, it came out in October. And uh, the Saturday after Thanksgiving that year, the San Francisco Chronicle did a story on the book, the whole front page and the whole back page of the date book section. Oh, shit. Monday at noon, that book was sold out for 15, wow. 1,500 copies. We printed another 3,500 and sold out every single copy. Is that right? And it's called A San Francisco Love Affair, and this guy, Gene Wright. It was just... A, a, Gene Wright. And before he moved to San Francisco, he lived in Salt Lake City, had a commercial business, and he shot crime scenes for the police. Car accidents, murders, criminals, deaths, POWs that were from World War II mm-hmm. that were over in, in, in Salt Lake City. Um, an incredible body of work. And I think she donated that body of work to a to an archive somewhere also recently as well. Uh, but we did that book and it's amazing. A San Francisco love wow. affair. Yeah. They nice. still have those available or very few. Very I think few. I have a handful of limited editions, which is comes into like a slip case with like a little eight by 10 G clay print. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I have like 20 or 30 of them left and maybe like maybe five copies of the regular edition, but you can get that on rockoutbooks.com also beautiful book, beautiful photography. Excellent. Yeah. Nice. Cool. All so, right. Yeah. I appreciate that, man, so much. I got yeah. a lot going on in my world. I tell you. <laughs> Keeps it going. That's why I say we got to have to get him back in here. When yeah, I know. We are definitely. Because there's, a, like we said, there's another aspect to this guy we need to talk about. Yeah. All right. Anytime. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. And Jim, where can we find more information uh, about you, buddy? As always, jimwatkinsphoto.com. And you can see all my uh, links to the social platform right there. Fantastic. And you find you can find out more about me at recasper.com, all of my workshops, my portfolio. Uh, but above all, go and take a look at streetpx.com. That's where you're going to find all of our past episodes. And this one makes number 5050. We are fucking moving along. This man. was epic, wasn't it? Man? This, this, was, this was a proper was 50th. I, was I worthy of number 50? You were, yeah, you hell were worthy. Hell yeah, you were worthy. <laughs> you were worthy. 
we've we, been we, we've been wondering what we were going to do, but uh, this was perfect for it. And you know, we're doing it right here in the wonderful Harvey Milk Recording Studio. So a little bit of love for uh, a wonderful facility that has tons of classes. They're uh, they're pushed and and supported by the San Francisco Rec and Park, and uh, you know, it's just. It, they help us, and we like to help them. So whenever you get a chance, definitely take a look at sfrec.gov or harveymiltphotocenter.org for more information regarding their classes. Uh, beyond just the past episodes, you can find out uh, more about our merchandise. we got a ton of T-shirts there on streetpx.com. Uh, we also have our Patreon. So if you love what we have cooking over here and you want to help us keep these mics hot, the bandwidth flowing, go over to patreon.com forward slash streetpx, and you can give a buck, you can give five bucks, whatever you want to give. You can get uh, prints, you can get portfolio reviews, you can get our ringtone, whatever it is. Any money that goes through Patreon goes right back into the show and helps us continue bringing in these phenomenal guests uh, to bring that inspiration from our mic to your ears. Um, So, yes, thank you all for listening, and uh, we're going to let Jay go. Thank you again, brother. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. And also remember, guys, November 9th, 5.30 at the Harvey Milk Center, come down to the opening. Yes. Jay's opening. Please do. Thank oh, you. Oh, man, it'll be fantastic. Yeah. There's going to be a big uh, click this button to add to the calendar link right there on the show notes. So go and do that right now. I mean, unless you're driving, then wait, get home, and then do it. <laughs> but above <laughs> that, we will talk to all of you again in two weeks. Cheers. See you later. Bye. Bye.